appeal in the matter of Adams and Option SIP UK LLP and another. Uh, Mr. McMillan. Yeah. My Lord, my ladies. Um, I obviously represent Mr. Adams, uh, the appellant, my then friend Mr. Jugasia uh, sits behind me, my then friend Mr. Moran of Queen's Council uh, for the respondent. Uh, the matters remain to be addressed uh, in this consequentials hearing uh, are the nature and quantum of any further relief. I think in my note I said the quantum of relief, but I think we might need to just wind back a bit and look at the nature of the relief just to deal with uh, the awkward matter of the store pods. Uh, and also, secondly, the costs below uh, and Mr. Adams' Part 36 offer, which is uh, contested uh, as a Part 36 offer. Your Lordship and Your Ladyships will remember we had uh, a three-day hearing virtually back in uh, March, first week of March. Uh, we have the benefit of Your Lordship and Ladyship's judgments uh, in tab one of the bundle for this hearing. Um, I don't propose to go through that in any detail. I, mean, I should say, we've all looked at the materials, got ourselves back into the case, and looked at the extra materials that you have between you provided. Indeed. And, and you'll see, fundamentally, the, the, the key point, I think, which may have meant we were listed for a day was the tax treatment of the, yes. of the issue. That, that uh, at the very last minute, has definitely fallen away. And, and uh, so we have hopes that we'll be finished by lunchtime. Uh, I think that must be realistic. So, so it, it's almost down to the store pods. In fact, we, we can make it more narrow than that. The figure for relief in my skeleton argument, uh, which is in the, the bundle, uh, page 51, 52, paragraph 27, it's the expert's scenario B, which is 92,000. 37522 is basically agreed subject to store pods. So just to be clear, uh, this seems realistic, but you're not contending for scenario A, you accept that the 4,000 should be taken into account yes. as an input figure rather than taken yeah. off at the end. I, th I think we think that's the... the it makes sense. The, the sensible outcome. I think we, we've coalesced around that. I'm a learned friend for, for your note in his uh, skeleton argument of paragraph 20, uh, again, subject to store pods. I think that figure is common ground between us. So the actual quantum is there, but for the, the store pods issue. Yes. In, in the bundle, tab two, is the order on the original hearing. And just to point up a page 44, the first declaration. Yes. Which is that, two under section 27 of the Financial Services and Markets Act 2000, the agreement entered into between the appellant and the respondent uh, concerning the establishment and operation of the self-invested personal pension, the agreement, is unenforceable against the appellant, and the appellant is entitled to consequential relief. And so we say that records the first of the three statutory consequences, uh, which is that the appellant's election not to have the SIP enforceable against him. And today's debate is about the other two statutory consequences, which is um, first, restitution, and secondly, compensation. And, and, and there's a difference, I think, between the way in which my learned friend and I approached it. He talks about compensation, but we say, no, it's all three. It's yeah. unenforceability, uh, restitution, and compensation. And but you haven't broken down the 92,000 odd figure into the restitution element and the compensation element. You simply treat it all as one figure. I, indeed, but yeah. the restitution element would be the transfer payment figure yes. of 55,000. Yeah. Yes. And it's, it's, it's a straightforward case in which you get back the transfer across, uh, and then you, the compensation reflects the, the lost investment opportunity in the original yeah. personal pension lady, yes. But just to, just because it, it really is a store pod seems to be the issue between us, so I just want to get into just what the statutory mechanism is. Uh, and our submission is it's a straightforward uh, statutory codification of rescission. Yeah. It's a rescission remedy. And so using classical language, it involves a, a giving back and a taking back on both sides. And in some ways, it, it might be as, as straightforward as this. So the restitution is the, the transfer in. The, the compensation we've agreed is the investment opportunity. 
Uh, and we say it's a condition of our relief today that we make counter restitution of the store pods. And it, it may be more precise than that. It might be we give up the right to look to the store pods as a source of future retirement income provision. Effectively a thing in action. And the statute we say is is just like um, the common law, more probably, properly equity, where you have a failed contract, for example, one vitiated by fraud or misrepresentation, one gets the equitable remedy of rescission. Um, and section 26 of 28 it is dealing with a problem that really was once dealt with by the common law of illegality. So in the old days of statutory licensing of of financial services providers, um, a, a contract with an unauthorized provider, for example, like an insurer, would be wholly void at common law. So in fact, neither side could enforce. So one of the main injustices dealt with by the, the one-sided unenforceability is, for example, if you do a deal with an unlicensed insurer, the policyholder has the, the option to enforce. So the the background to this all goes back, like many of these things, to Professor Gower and the, his review of investment protection in the 1980s. You don't need to go to that. But it's, it's very much just dealing with the, the risk that would have happened had the common law of illegality pre Patel and Merza in the Supreme Court come in and landed very strongly here. And so what it in, brings in is a, a right on the, the counterparty to seek effectively statutory rescission. And so if we just take up the Act um, from the Authorities Bundle, tab 2, and today is an exercise under, under Section 28. Do you mean 28? I do mean 28 tonight. Mm. Um, so one, one can start, but if you, if, if you look at one to start with 27, uh, one can start with 27 subsection 2, my lord, obviously, mm -hmm. and one looks at the fact that the other party, Mr. Adams, is entitled to recover any money or property uh, paid or transferred by him under the agreement, and B, compensation for any loss sustained by him as a result of having parted with it. And you say, realistically, that's got to be read in the context of the sort of deals that we're dealing with. In other words, you can't take a literal meaning of uh, money or property paid or transferred in the sense that what there is is a transfer of rights, which is what the other side are arguing. Yes. Actually got to mean what actually went across into the new, from the old pension to the new one. Indeed. And, and yeah. what he had under a, a personal pension plan with an insurer was a purely contractually based investment yeah. to look to the, the funds of the life insurer. Yeah. Uh, and he swapped that for uh, a different arrangement in, to look in to... in virtually any situation where you're dealing with this sort of investment. Indeed. So so just, just pausing on A then... There's a transfer across, which you say is a transfer of property. Yes. Um, whether or not it's of money. Um, if Mr. Adams recovers what was transferred across, um, then that's a lot. Um, rather than what was transferred across less than store pods. Well, I'm going to come on to the store pods because I say it's a condition that, that we give those back. So, in, in fact, one looks at it in terms of timing, of course. The, the, the SIP is unenforceable from, from day one. Yes. So th there is the argument that, of course, nothing that happened after the cash comes in matters. Mm. You know, it's, it's simply not something the court can take notice of. Well, that's the very simplistic way of looking at it. Yes. It, it, but it, it has a certain it, attraction. It has a certain attraction. It, it's those steps, the whole point of uh, Section 27 is, is there to say that... <coughs> Um, this arrangement, which has been brokered through an un unregulated intermediary, is unenforceable against Mr. Adams. Okay, can I just explore? I know you're going to come to this, but let's explore it a moment longer. Suppose that the money were coming back to Mr. Adams personally rather than into the SIP. And that there are very, very good reasons for it going into the SIP, but suppose it were coming back to him personally. So 50 whatever thousand pounds goes across. Looking no further than A, 
he's entitled to have 50 odd thousand pounds back. Um, and potentially you don't get as far as worrying about restitution. He just gets the 50 odd thousand pounds back and options is left with the store board. Yes. I mean, I, I, I'd, no. I'd accept that. I mean, we, we have to not be blinded by the fact that actually nobody wants these store <laughs> in a different In a different transaction, when mm. actually what had gone into the SIP was something that valuable, proper shares or some proper investment thing, then I thought what you were saying, you, you said right at the beginning, is that actually Mr um, Adams has to give back the store pods as a condition of benefit of rescinding the contract. Yes. Um, now, in fact, I don't know whether options actually want these store pods back, but if they don't, well, that's it's still something he has to do to get the rescission of the contract. Yes. As you said, both sides have to give back what, what they got. Um, and in a normal case, as I say, they would want this. If it, and they would then sell them to sort out their loss, and they think they can sell them for fifteen thousand pounds. Well, then good luck to them. Um, but but that's a kind of wrinkle of this particular yes. transaction. Well, lady, I, I was thinking this morning, it's, it's like the judgment of Solomon, but nobody here wants a baby. Um, <laughs> it's it's it's, it's um, no, you have it. Is 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 the message about the store pods? Yeah. Um, I think the consequence of. Of, of these proceedings and related proceedings might be that they have quite a good collection of store pods at the end of um, end of it, and they they could open a business perhaps of <laughs> in Blackburn, Lancashire. But it, it, it's a case that really these are and it's dealt with it, it, quite simply. We say not only if you were looking at it through the background common law or equity, uh, but in terms in section 28. So just a quick look at this, and it might just short circuit much of the discussion about store pods. So it, it's it's obvious that to use Latin briefly, the, the old idea of restitutio and integrum, now seen as being counter-restitution, uh, is explicitly here. So section 28, subsection 2, 2b is what we're doing today, which is obviously assessing the amount of the compensation by the court. And then we can skip down to subsection 7. And this may be the point that the Lady, Lady Rose was making about yeah. if it had been a good investment, if it had gone into shares in or Bitcoin, perhaps, and you, you got out at the right time, um, Miss Adams has the election to enforce the, the unenforceable agreement, but he hasn't done that. He's, he's sought in these proceedings to render it unenforceable. Uh, he elects not to perform the agreement, uh, or as a result of this section, recovers money paid or other property transferred by him under the agreement. He must repay any money and return any other property uh, received by him under the agreement. Uh, and we say the closing words of section 28.7 make it clear that, that, that counter-restitution of the store pods is, is mandated by the statute, and it's, it, it's well, a straightforward... So technically, it would cover the £4,000 as well, but that's already accounted for in the calculation of compensation. Yes, I mean, we, we've, we've made a concession on the £4,000. Oh, yeah, it, it could be more conceptually difficult than that, but it's, yeah. it's, it's a straightforward. We say we... we yeah. We, we come before the court, we, we've been given a remedy, and we accept that we've had that £4,000. Yes. But if, if he's obliged, as he seems to be under Section 28.7, he, he must return any other property received by him, then the other person must accept it. Yes, well, they, they can abandon it, I suppose. Yeah. That's common law, but it's... Uh, uh, we, we say, in fact, it's not the store pods. It, it is the right, the thing in action, which is the right to look to the store pods purchased by the trustees as a potential source of future retirement income. And we're giving up that thing in action. So who actually owns the store pods? Well, if you look at the lease, which is in the authorities bundle at tab 16. The hearing bundle or the authorities? The supplementary bundle, bundle for this hearing, yes. <coughs> see it's a, a title D between Store First Blackburn Limited uh, and Carey Pensions Trustees UK Limited, uh, RDE Adams, obviously my client, 
but it's it's reasonably clear at page 2254 the parties to the lease uh, the landlord is Straw First Blackburn Limited company registered in Burnley uh, and the tenant is Carey Pensions Trustee UK Limited with his company number uh, marked with the account of RDE Adams 2123 so it's the legal tenant is clearly the sister company the trustee company um, the lender friend says that we don't even have a beneficial interest in it, mm. um, but it's some kind of right to a right to look to that. So, so, so there's only a leasehold of them. That's what's owned by somebody, and according to this, it's owned by option. Yes, option so, is trustee company. So, on this thesis, either Mr. Adams hasn't actually received the store pods, so he doesn't need to return them. Or if he has received them, he has to return them under Section 28.7. Yes. Or at least give up whatever right he has in yes. relation to them. Yes. Yeah. To be. But whether that's, I mean, my Lord Lord Justice, he says there's no equitable interest. Mm. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, and, and that that may. May be correct, and if, if, if it is, if it is, if, if it's not correct, if there was an actual interest, we give that up. Uh, if it's a lesser right to look to it, like a, a, the right of a, a beneficiary under a discretionary trust, we give that up as well as a condition of relief. I mean, I, I did add to the authorities bundle uh, the very recent uh, judgment of this court in uh, in school facility management. I think it's from earlier this week. Um, which I, th I think just, just to sort of close off the point uh, about the nature of relief. And so this, this was a trial before uh, Mr. Justice Foxton. Uh, there's a school on the Isle of Wight, which was a merger of a Catholic and an Anglican school. Mm. They open a sixth form. Uh, as it turns out, they, they need a building for that. They enter into a lease for the building uh, through obviously a finance operation. And after three years of paying the effectively finance lease rates of, 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 of rent uh, to an assignee of the original building contractor, they uh, stop paying the rent uh, and they say the whole contract is ultra vires and void. So the the conclusion at trial is that, which is not challenged on the appeal, is that the whole arrangement was ultra vires and void. It was a finance lease, not an operating lease, and that required the consent of the Secretary of State for Education, which had not been obtained. And there were two periods uh, in it. So, effectively, the school has paid the notional rent for three years, but the recipient of that has actually got a change of position defence which, which massively outweighs that because they've obviously sold off the right in, in return for a stream of income. So their change of position defence wiped that out completely. In terms of the value of the benefit to the school, the only evidence was of the operating lease type of value of it. And Mr Justice Foxton decided that, well, uh, in this situation, whilst the... Um, the claimant, uh, the claimant was basically entitled to uh, the operating lease going forward. What the what the um, what the council, the school wanted to do, was say, well, no, actually, we should only be paying at the operating lease level all the way through, and that means that in fact we don't owe you any money for this. So, the question is how you deal with those two points of time, um, and it was a very small point before Mr. Justice Fox, and it becomes the main issue before this court. Uh, in the hearing we had. So you'll see the issue in the authorities bundle. It's, it's posed by uh, Lord Justice Popperwell uh, in paragraph one. So the sole issue in this court was a short point uh, as to whether in a claim for restitution of benefits uh, conferred under a contract which is void as ultra vires one of the parties, uh, the provider of the benefits uh, must give credit for all benefits it received under the contract notwithstanding it as a change of position defence to any restitutionary claim for those benefits it received. Uh, the judge held not. Uh, 
If you haven't been involved in all the first 25 moves of the chess game of the modern law on Justin Richmond, that might not be the most easy <laughs> summary of the issue before the court, but there we go. Um, you'll see that, just for our purposes, we don't need to look in too much detail, but it's quite a helpful source of uh, background in the law of restitution and counter-restitution. So pa paragraph 25. Just recording the submission says it was common ground that there is a principle by which in certain circumstances uh, a party seeking a restitution remedy for unjust enrichment must give credit for benefits received from the other party. Uh, this is now commonly referred to the principle of counter-restitution, uh, reflecting the concept previously referred to in the authorities uh, as, the, as restitutio in integrum. Uh, and then he records that there's, there is some disagreement as to how it gets applied here. And I think we can skip forward to paragraph 34. And this is really the issue for this particular court, uh, how it should be justified by reference to the four stages uh, of the restitutionary inquiry. Uh, as a spoiler, the court decides eventually it doesn't matter on, on the facts of this particular case. Uh, but he looks through it in terms of the various uh, methods of doing it, whether uh, counter-restitution prevents or pro tanto reduces the enrichment of the defendant <coughs> under unjust, whether it might make the enrichment not unjust or only unjust in the net sum. Thirdly, is a cross-claim. Uh, and fourthly, probably most poignant here, is, is as, as a condition of recovery. Uh, it may be a condition of the claimant recovering unjust enrichment for the benefits conferred, that he must give credit for benefits received in exchange. And he refers back to an example he's given. And so we say whichever way you work it, but pretty most likely condition of recovery. That's very similar to what the statute provides for here. And I, I won't labour this point because I think it's, it's a very useful recent statement of the common law equity here. But just uh, taking paragraphs 40 and 41. The juridical basis... Uh, was that the court was doing what was practically just. See uh, Erlanger and New Sombrero Phosphate Co. Uh, per Lord Blackburn at 1279. Uh, the technique used was to ret require the return of the benefit by the claimant as a condition for the grant of the claimant's claim in restitution. So in Erlanger, a case in which the claimant had purchased a mine which had a residual value having been part worked, uh, the order of the Court of Appeal upheld by the House of Lords was repayment of the price upon condition the mine was then returned to the defendant uh, together with the claimant's profits from working it. And of course that practically just approach to rescission is, is established since the seminal judgment of Lord, Lord Blackburn in Erlanger. Then he refers to uh, Dunbar Bank and Nadim uh, and in fact I probably won't refer to the facts of that. The question is whether or not uh, a, a wife challenging a, a mortgage for undue influence has to account for the capital sum received. Uh, but Lord Justice Morritt, uh, with whom Lord Justice Potter agreed, quotes the other sort of 19th century classical guidance, that of uh, Lord Justice Bowen uh, in New Beginning and Adam, 1886. Uh, when you come to consider what is the exact relief to which a person is entitled in a case of misrepresentation, uh, it seems to me to be this and nothing more. Uh, that he's entitled to have the contract rescinded and is entitled to all the incidents and consequences of such rescission. Uh, it is said that the injured party is entitled to be re replaced in status quo. Uh, it seems to me that when you're dealing with innocent misrepresentation, you must understand the proposition that he is to be replaced in status st st quo with this limitation, that he's not to be replaced in exactly the same position or respect, <coughs> otherwise he's <coughs> entitled to recover damages. But he is to be replaced in this position so far as regards the rights and obligations uh, which have been created by the contract in which he has been induced to enter. Uh, that seems to be the true doctrine. I think this is the, put the neatest way in Redgrave and Heard. So, so we say just very, very simply, we are giving up any rights or obligations, and in particular any right to look to the store pots as a source of retirement income provision in the future. And then finally, um, Lord Justice Morritt quotes... Lord Justice Bowen saying very famously uh, that orders appears to me to be giving back and a taking back on both sides including the giving back and taking back of the obligations which the contract has created 
as well as a giving back and a taking back of the advantages. Uh, and we say that's, that's straightforwardly the case. And just at 43, just uh, the conclusion drawn by the Court of Appeal this week was this historical basis uh, for the principle of counter-restitution therefore supports Mr. Salzido's contention, counsel for the respondent, uh, <coughs> that it is a condition of recovery. And just turning back, there might be one point, just to, to finish this off back in the, the statute. There's a debate, of course, and I think it's probably resolved now, in non-statutory rescission about what happens if you can't make specific restitution of things. Uh, that is also dealt with uh, in Section 28, at least in the situation in which you cannot make specific counter-restitution of a thing because it's being transferred to a third party. And you'll see that's dealt with in Section 28, page 6 of the Authority Bundle, Section 28, uh, subsection 8 which is that if property transferred under the agreement is passed to a third party, a reference in section 26 or 27 or this section to that property is to be read as a reference to its value at the time of the transfer under the agreement. So it transmutes by statute any, any property transferred to a third party to its cash value at the time of transfer. So it, the statute itself makes a point that is debated by academics and the judges about whether you can have substitutionary counter-restitution in cash. And in the mini code of sections 26 to 28, the answer is quite clear under section 28, subsection 8. And for absolute completeness, just take a quick look at 28, subsection 9. Uh, the commission of an authorization offence, that's a, a breach of section 19, uh, does not make the agreement concerned illegal or invalid to any greater extent uh, than is provided by sections 26 or 27. That takes you out of the common law of illegality for this mini code. Uh, and we say whether approached through the straightforward statutory construction of section 28 or bearing in mind the background common law equity, uh, there's a very clear answer to what happens to the store pods or whatever right Mr. Adams had to look to the store pods in this case. And, and those really are my, my submissions on nature and quantum of relief. <coughs> Just to be clear, you say, well, you don't want them. you're quite happy to surrender the store pods. <coughs> Uh, therefore, the value of them is relevant. Um, just supposing that Mr. Moran persuaded us that the value was relevant, um, I assume you don't like the 15,000 figure. Um, uh, uh, and you say, well, uh, options <coughs> most recently itself attached a value of uh, £2,580 to the store pods. Um, so I assume that that, you would say, was the ceiling of the valuation if it mattered. Yes. That would be my fallback. I, mean, I think that, that only really comes up in, um, well, it, it, if, it, if it comes up in relief, um, it, it will be that. Um, we can actually just have a quick look at those. In, 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 the, in the, the tab, we have all the valuations um, that we've been able to find. So in tab six of the hearing bundle, Sort of 169, 17, yeah, through to 171. Well, it, it, it's 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 more interesting how it how it goes down, my lord. Just just yes. just maybe just take it. So if one looks at one looks at page 161, um, you'll see that the property in the scheme is is the store first 100% share, 52,500 initially. So that's in uh, and period ended February 2013. 
Um, so effectively, it's being valued at cost. And obviously, valuing these store plots has been problematic. Um, you'll see by page 164. So this is the valuation report by asset class as of 26 of February 2015. Um, they had reduced by half the value to 26,250. And that was also recorded, I think, in the High Court judgment as being a 50% reduction in the first couple of years. If one looks, I think, at page... So if if the if the I don't know whether any of these store pods were actually rented out for payment during the course of them being in this SIP, and if so, what happens to any rental monies that were received? Yes, I, th I think we we did account for that at trial. It was a very trumpery sum, as you might say. It was a few hundred pounds, and I think that technically is something we account back to as as a condition of of relief. But it's. Uh, uh, it's, 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 it may be in the particulars of claim, but it, it's definitely made clear that when we sought relief, we did offer counter restitution of I think a couple of hundred pounds that had been received. I had, I had in mind it was ninety something, but it, may well <laughs> it, be it was a definitely a, a, a sum of it's very small amount. Two thousand seventeen, there was ninety one pounds eighty received. Ninety one pounds eighty. But I think it might have had some the year before that as well. Yes, I see. It's, it's certainly no higher than two hundred pounds. So I, I, I did think about it when the lady was, was making the point about this, but. Um, um, we, we've already said we'd, we'd take that into account. The it, most recent valuation I could find was the £430 per unit on page 170. That's so right. That's over a year ago. That's right. And, and, it, the, and FOSS has certainly been valuing them at zero, hasn't it? I think that's right. I think that's right. But the one I was going to point out to, 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 to you, Lord and your ladyships, is about <coughs> page 167. So <coughs> the, the, the trial was in 2018. And I think my own friend did actually do the valuation evidence uh, at, at trial and submissions. Uh, you, you'll see that, in fact, he managed to persuade the expert that it was worth more than their own internal valuation at the date of the trial, which was 10,500. Mm. So even, even at the date of trial, uh, the trial figure looks a little bit high. Uh, and if you go back to the first instance judgment, it's clear that the expert struggled to put any kind of realistic <coughs> comparator on these. And, and I, think, I think it's my lady. Lady Justice Andrews is right. Uh, a, a figure of zero might be more appropriate, but uh, that's why the most recent valuation is the uh, four hundred thirty-five <coughs> per, per store pod, and they are there are six of them, emotionally linked to our account. So yep. we say that's the absolute highest um, evidence before the court. Yeah. So we, we say it's it's actually a straightforward matter of statutory construction. Nothing unusual of the nature or quantum of relief here. Um, but if we were if we were with you on them going back by way of counter restitution, is there something that we need to order to happen in order for that to happen? Well, I, 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 I'd probably see it as a recital to the order. But, um, um, well, maybe, maybe we need to. That will be something that parties need to think about as if and when it um, arises. I, mean, I imagine that may overlap with Mr Moran's point about the Part 36 offer, the mechanics that would then have been needed to yes. shift the store pot. Indeed. I mean, th there's a debate about whether or not I should, I should go on to Part 36 now, whether it's appropriate yes. to address this issue. Because it, <coughs> you, you've really dealt with everything now except costs, have you? Yes, indeed. So I think, I, should we uh, just yes. keep to this issue? Yes. Do, do you know, I, I say that, Mr. McMill, perhaps it would be, since there is some degree of interrelation between the issues, perhaps <laughs> if you complete your submissions on costs as well, and then yes. we'll hear Mr. Moran. And it, it, it may well be that, in some ways, my submissions on costs are, are a little bit responsive, because obviously we start from the position this is a, this is a Part 36 offer. Um, and 
the, the burden really is on him to, to show that it would be unjust for the consequences to follow. So I, I can foreshadow that, but obviously uh, much of my uh, submissions yes, will be really by way of response to that. So we do say it's actually worth turning up the, uh, the part of the basic offer. Um, which is in tab 10. And normally the narrative of these things is not of much interest subsequently. Um, but, but it was, it is interesting how in the third paragraph, <coughs> uh, and whilst it might have been correct at trial, he says, considering your client's stance is set out in correspondence, uh, we do not consider it would have any reasonable prospect of success at trial, uh, because the purpose of section 27 FISMA 2000 is to sharply distinguish each side of the perimeter between the regulated and unregulated environments. In setting out a remedy against a regulated person for breaches of an unregulated person, it is clear that the purpose is that of consumer protection. It is the cornerstone of that statute of provision. Therefore, your client's assertion that a lack of actual or constructive knowledge of such breach is contradictory to the position adopted by the FSA, which places the onus upon your client to ensure compliance uh, rather than enable them to turn a blind eye and therefore avoid liability. Uh, any other result would only serve the quality of this provision. We now propose to traverse the entire breach as the purpose of this offer, uh, as we consider the above alone will prove decisive. So it's remarkably uh, uh, robust account of really where we got to in the end. Um, and so the, the terms of the offer are your client pays our client damages in the sum of 63,124 uh, within 14 days of acceptance of this offer. Uh, your client takes ownership of the store pods, store pods in question, uh, and your client pays our client's reasonable costs uh, to be assessed in the absence of agreement. And then with the usual um, statements that we would expect in, in this context. Uh, and here the, the relevant uh, comparator is in the figures in the uh, Asset Risk Consultant Report in tab 7. It's at page 181, it's scenario D. Uh, and you see the conclusion of page 182, the notional transfer value uh, as of the 31st of March 2016 for Friends Life Policy Number based on transfer payment of 31st of May 2012. After subtraction of the £4,000 introduced payment uh, at that time is £70,449.21. So uh, we said that there's about a, a, at least a 10% discount, really, effectively in the Part 36 offer uh, on, on that figure at the time. Um, and in fact, if you look at it as a restitution plus compensation case, um, it's less than £10,000 on top for the, comp for the compensation being suggested in, in, in 2016. The other point to note about the date of the offer uh, is that uh, as of March 2016, uh, Mr. Adams was over 55 years of age as well. What's the relevance of that? Well, it, it, it foreshadows. The learned friend wants to say that, that we might be involved in pensions <coughs> liberation, but in fact, um, under a self-invested personal pension plan, generally one can start taking benefits. You couldn't have taken the whole 63,000 without engaging in pensions liberation for yourself. Well, it, it wouldn't be pensions liberation in my, in my submission. It would be 25% would be tax-free, and then it would be a tax-inefficient way of taking the remaining 75%, yes. but it would not be pensions liberation. Mm. In any event, they didn't come back and say, well, <coughs> we can't pay you 
damages straightforwardly, but we could pay it into the set. No. In, indeed, and obviously Part 36 encourages that type of uh, reference point if, if that was the, the issue they had. Well, that's just um, a mechanism um, mechan for getting the money. You're, you're saying, well, what we were asking for was compensation of 63124, which is going back to us in return for, for you have the store pods for what good they are. Yeah. And the, we accept entirely that the damages paid out to us as a lump sum is a, is a tax inefficient way of, of receiving this, this benefit, and, and we've worked around that. <coughs> Um, but it doesn't make it doesn't make this part 36 offer pensions liberation by the back door. So you say, well, part 36 lays down certain requirements for a part 36 offer. This letter meets those requirements, and. Therefore, various consequences follow unless the court thinks it's unjust that they should follow. Yes. And it, it's, it's the formidable obstacle of, of showing that it's unjust. I mean, you, 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 your clerk did refer us to, um, uh, to Web. I can have a look at that. Obviously, you wanted us to address you on the, the Web case. The, the, what I had in mind, I, I don't think Mr. Moran makes this point, actually. But um, uh, I had in mind that supposing we were satisfied that there was a valid Part 36 offer, it wouldn't then be the right course for us to work out some proportion of costs that you should have at first instance to feed into the, the Part 36 assessment. Uh, it would rather be the case that you get the lot unless and until we decide it's unjust that you should get the lot. It, it's, it, it's, it's all done through Part 36 rather than through Part 44. Yes, it, it's a code within a code. Yeah. Yes. And. Um, we say that, that Mr. Moran doesn't escape from the, the mini code within the code. Um, he gives four reasons in his uh, written submissions uh, why it's not within Part 36, but only the last one, the fourth one, is relying upon the injustice hurdle. So I'll, I'll address those to make sure that, that the court has my point on it. So I think in his uh, written skeleton, what we say, of course, is that he starts at paragraph 22, diving straight into part 44, um, which I think is a point that Webb says is not the right way around. It, I mean, it would be if, if it weren't a valid part 36. Offer. Indeed. So, but the, the, the logical starting point in the structure of the CPR is part 36. Um, and I think it's, it's one of the, the, the quotations within, within Webb is, of course, Part 36 trumps Part 44 here. Um, so the reasons why it's suggested at, at paragraph, starting at paragraph 30, I think are fourfold. And we say that, that in our submissions as to the treatment of the store pods, he doesn't make good, really, his first point that we haven't beaten uh, our Part 36 offer. I mean, the offer says you keep the store pods. Yes. If you're keeping the, the store pods, um, it's hard to see how you make a deduction. Indeed, it's, it's, it should be neutral entirely. So if there were £50,000, it, it would be neutral. So we, we, we say the correct figure is, is scenario D in the expert report. Um, and so we have beaten our part 36 offer. Uh, we say the store pods at best are neutral in terms of this because the, the part 36 explicitly makes them uh, a matter we will give back. And, and again, our part 36 looked at through the prism of, of section 28 is, is textbook. It's saying exactly what section 28 required us to say. And if you're against me on that, even, even as a fallback on the respondent's current valuation, we still beat the part 36 offer. So we say he doesn't get home on his, his first point. His second one 
is the one that has been foreshadowed by my lady, Lady Justice Andrews, which he says, well, it wasn't a Part 36 offer that we could accept as presented. And we've looked at the lease and we say, well, we don't think, again, you can make this good given what the lease says, which is that the legal owner... And where where does that requirement of it being capable of acceptance as written come from? I, I, think, I think he's saying that um, uh, effectively we would have to go through the various steps in the lease to transfer it back. So it, it's, a it's a mechanics point, as far as I can see, about the mechanics of, of retransfer. Yes, we say about, I think my lady's point is, whereabouts in part 36, is there anything about you having to be able to offer the, uh, accept the offer as seen? Well, indeed, well, the answer to that is isn't, it isn't there in Part 36, and it's a code. Uh, and, and just expressing that slightly differently, I don't think, well, certainly Part 36 doesn't say that it has to be in the nature of a contractual offer. I mean, obviously, if we were dealing with contract law, for there to be the possibility of forming a contract, the offer would be have, have to be something capable oh. of being contractually accepted. Um, part 36 doesn't say that. Um, and it isn't obvious that that should be the position. Yeah. We, we say, I mean, quite simply, if, if it's saying that it's not sufficiently certain to be an enforceable contract of law, I, I, I have the point. Um, we say that doesn't really arise here because we've looked at the lease and the legal tenant already is the trustee company. Um, There's the nothing that Mr Adams needs to do other than sign a piece of paper or put a recital down saying, I don't want anything to do with these, op uh, with these um, door faults. I, I, I give up my right. I give up any, right any rights under the SIP. Have. I give up any rights under the SIP. On condition of the uh, appellant giving up any right he has under the SIP, <coughs> the following orders are made. It's, it's as straightforward as that, we say, yes. I mean, under the lease, I don't remember there being a requirement of getting landlord's approval not to be unreasonably withheld or something. Uh, well, there's something to do with the assignment, but we don't even need to go there, do we? Because you won't be assigning anything. Indeed. I mean, we, we, well, we, we have no legal or beneficial interest. I don't know what we're, what we're assigning. It's, it's a right to look to the trustees, to look to assets that they legally and beneficially own mm. for mm. retirement income provision. So it's simply giving up our right, any right we have under the SIP to retirement income provision or, or any payment of benefits. So, so we, we don't think we can make good the point here, which is that on this court's own judgment, the trustee company is the legal and beneficial owner of the store policy. I mean, Frank can't have it, having so eloquently persuade, persuaded you that uh, we have no legal and beneficial interest in the store pods now to sort of switch switch horses uh, at this late stage uh, in the proceedings. <coughs> and I think I've dealt with his third point in paragraphs 34, although it, it, it may be there's some point in the Finance Act that uh, it is a problem for uh, the trustee company, which I don't think really is a concern of, of Mr. Adams, but we say it's not pensions liberation by the back door or any other way. And... Well, even if it were, uh, just for the sake of argument, that um, there would be a problem with the trustees accepting the offer, or the, the mechanics of the offer by simply paying the money back, uh, that's a mechanism. The principle is, I want 60-something thousand pounds and you can have the store parts. So... The offer could be accepted by saying, well, um, let's see if we can deal with this in a way which is um, appropriate, and if necessary, we'll um, put an order before the court and get the court to sanction it. Yeah. In other words, we will consent to an order being made for restitution under Section 27 and Section 28, uh, and it can be put into the appropriate legal language to protect us. And, and it can be waived in front of the HMRC, if that's the issue, yes. because... But the tax legislation, as I understand it, accommodates itself to the underlying private law of rights and obligations. Well, yes. We, we need to be... Everyone's stressing that this is a test case, so there may be other owners of... Uh, other people who've entered into a similar SIP who are not 55 years old. Mm. Um, 
But as my lady says, that that's <coughs> a mechanics point that may be more difficult for other people than it is actually for Mr. Adams. <coughs> Well, the, the, the useful, it's not really a precedent, but the useful example this case could give is, is the re agreement reached by the parties that the, the compensation takes the form of topping up the SIP. Um, and that, that would be a useful guide in the future for, for parties, whether age 55 or under. Um, and that, that, that seems to, and obviously there can be an immediate transfer to another provider. In, in this case, Mr. Adams has a now a workplace pension. So it, it, that can be transferred, and the mechanics of that are already underway. So that that would be the, the precedent, and I think my lady, lady Justice Andrews pointed out that the uh, the ombudsman has been doing this already. So <coughs> there are several hundred cases before the ombudsman, and, and the one I included, we don't need to go through it, um, reaches remarkably similar conclusion to to, to this court, uh, and says, I believe in other cases you've you've taken back the store pods, so so do that again is is what it says, um, and g given they are the legal and beneficial owners, uh, it's hard to see why that is not not the case. So does that leave Mr. Moran's point that they say, well, we're not in a position to quantify your loss? Yes, I mean, that, that, that's it. I mean, uh, which, if you start from the point of view that, of ignoring the restitution element, um, in, in fact, as it turns out, we asked for about £10,000 of investment growth at the time of the Part 36. That doesn't look unrealistic. In fact, was a good, uh, a good account. As we know from the expert report, I think it's two of the three funds were basically publicly available to financial professionals like the respondent. You could work out yourself exactly what the, the relevant, the now Aviva funds, I think, under management of Aviva uh, would be. And um, the only reason we needed an expert was because of the with profits funds were a bit more, uh, yeah, a bit bit more tricky. knowledge is, is required but because of the discretions and smoothing. Would options have known that it was those three funds that were that it was invested in in Friends Life? Uh, maybe not, but of course the question could have been asked under yeah. under Part Thirty Six. Mm. But in, in terms of um, in terms of quantification of loss, I mean, uh, we're now at ninety odd thousand pounds. It was fifty thousand odd pounds of. of cash equivalent and transfer value, uh, and a part 36 at 60,000 pounds was hardly one that was uh, begging for questions to explain its basis. It, it's reasonably obvious what the basis for it was. Um, and uh, again, the, me the mechanism is there in part 36. It's 36, I want to say, uh, eight, isn't it? Clarification of a part 36 it's offer. Strictly, in this respect, it's not a matter of clarifying the offer so much as clarifying the claim, isn't it? I mean, it's perfectly clear what your saying the offer is, yeah. you'll take 60 whatever thousand. Yes. Um, uh, now, it may be that it would have been helpful to options to know more about the calculation of your claim, but it's not actually a matter of clar clarifying the offer, as far as I can see. No, it, it's, it's asking for, a, for valuation evidence, really, at, at that point. I think the point is that, that Mr. Moran is making is, is that, well, um, in order to be able to assess for ourselves whether or not it's, reason, it's a reasonable offer that we ought to be accepting, we've got to at least know the ballpark of what your um, ultimate claim would be worth if you were to win it at trial. And at the moment, we know that you're claiming your 55,000 back, um, but we don't know um, where the extra 10,000 comes from, what the basis for it is. Um, and until we do that, we can't possibly stand back and make a proper evaluation of your offer. I think that's the nub of, um, yeah. of the point that's being taken. Actually, it's 8,000, isn't it? Well, it's 8, a bit 000. less than 8,000. It's, 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 not, it's not, a, not a huge amount of money in the big scheme of things. No. Um, but that, that, that's as high as you can put it. If that is um, his point, I, I'd say that it, it doesn't make it unjust <coughs> in the ordinary course of Part 36. Um, that, you know... The, the basis for an £8,000 growth of an investment sum uh, is not spelt out with every I dotted and every T crossed. Um, well, you can certainly work out what the interest rate would be on it and make a counteroffer. Absolutely. So just taking up the web case, I, I assume you're 
multiple relationships have it, do you think? Um, I certainly do, and I, 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 I raised it with uh, Lady Rose and Lady Justice Andrews, and I know they've looked at it. Um, the, the, do we actually need, I'm not, we could wait to see whether Mr. Rand has any point on it. Um, uh, on the face of it, as I understand it, what it says is that once you've decided there's a Part 36 offer, uh, you, you don't independently work out whether there should be some issue based or whatever Indeed. costs order at trial. You work out instead whether it's unjust to give the person who made the offer all the costs. Indeed. And, and, and that, that said, I mean, the, the one point I think I picked <coughs> out, I mean, it's, it's paragraph 36 to um, 38 are really the, the key points. And in some ways, it's, it's a quote from Mr. Justice Briggs, as he then was in Smith and Trafford Housing Trust, yeah. saying that Part 36, uh, sorry, the burden on, on a claimant who's failed to beat the defendant's Part 36 offer to show injustice is a formidable obstacle to obtaining a different cost order. Uh, and, and it's made clear that the burden is very much on the learned friend, but it's, it's a formidable obstacle in the, in the context of showing it's unjust. I, I can't say, obviously, that case reconciled, clarifies the point that I can't say issue-based cost orders are not impossible, but only once you've overcome the mountain mm. of injustice. Yeah. So um, we say this is exactly what Part 36 is designed to achieve. I mean, um, we made an offer. At no stage did the respondent make any offer. Uh, and if somebody was in the driving seat of, of making this into a test case, uh, it was the respondent. Well, they didn't make it a test case, or a, a, certainly, according to the skeleton argument, it didn't become a test case until it was on the judge's diet made an order on the 18th of October, and that was six months after your Part 36 offer. It was an ordinary, it started in the ordinary uh, county court, it was transferred into, into the, uh, the High Court Chancellor Division, um, and it was, we know that they were facing a number of claims like this, but, but it was the first one that came on, and... Um, it went all the way. So we, we say, in the ordinary way, that they could have dealt with this in the ordinary way of paying, paying our Part 36. Um, and we wouldn't be here today. And uh, we know that over half a million pounds of legal costs would not have been incurred on both sides. So, um, I mean, doubtless they were conscious of the fact there were lots of other claims and uh, they needed to worry about them as well. But, but we are in Part 36 about this particular yeah. claim. Can, can I ask a specific point? Suppose we end up deciding that there was a valid Part 36 offer and therefore we're within 36.17. That says that unless the court says otherwise, the claimant is entitled to uh, interest at a rate not exceeding 10% on certain things. What interest rate would you say it should be? Yes, I mean, we, 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 we've had a look at that, obviously, and, and in fact, the best point that we made, I think, we would say is that it's that element of, of Part 36 in, in which um, if we ask for 10% over base, uh, it's looking a little bit ambitious on our side of the court. Um, we factor in, of course, the, the benefit of the expert report is we have the investment growth in the SIP. Yes. So we'd be asking for a relatively modest uh, amount over base. And you're not going to put a figure on it? Uh, can, can I ask for 2% over base? Yes, I see. Um, I mean, obviously, each of the consequences of Part 36 are, are intended to at least incentivise yes. settlement. Um, I'm not going to ask for the top end because we have the investment growth. Yes. Uh, but we do ask for our 10% on top, and we do ask for the other consequences, indemnity costs, obviously. And the interest on costs that normally arises only runs from the date when you actually incur the, uh, pay the costs, isn't that right? Or, so there may be sort of staggered... That's right. anyway. Yes. I mean, obviously, we, we're entitled to interest on costs as well yeah. in the ordinary course of things. But yes, I'm not, I'm not going to ask for a huge punitive uh, interest calculation given I've already had the benefit of, of, of the growth in the fund. Yeah. So if there's any room for potential injustice, it would be at that end of the consequence, we would say, and that's about the best you can put. Yeah. So I think those are, those are my submissions on Part 36 as well, subject to what my learned friend says. Yep, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Ryan. <coughs> so, 
starting with the issue of compensation. My little friend's argument is essentially <coughs> saying that this is a restitutio in integrum type situation. The simple answer to that is that's just not what the statute says. The statute, at section 27, tab 2 of the authorities page 5, says, first of all, not that the agreement is simply unenforceable, but rather, 27 1, the agreement is made that is made is unenforceable against against the other party, so against Mr. Adams. So he can enforce that agreement against option. That's a start. It's still an agreement that's in place and extant. <coughs> and I'm going to come back to that in a little bit of detail in a few minutes. The second point is the remedy that is set out in the statute clearly delineated in section 27.2. The other party, Mr. Adams, is entitled to recover a, any money or property paid or transferred by him under the agreement, and b, compensation for any loss sustained by him as a result of having parted. It does not say that there should be restitution of integrum. It says exactly what it says. Recovery of money or property paid or transferred by him under the agreement and compensation for loss. So he gets back 55,000 in compensation? Well, if he can get back the 55,000. And that's the problem. Well, he can. You can give it to him. Yeah, well, it, it depends on how you... Yeah, yes, we can give him... Comp certainly we can give him compensation for that. But in terms of giving him back that, and this is where the, the problems with his analysis start. He starts with rights under the Friends Provident pension, personal pension. And if you will recall, going back to the RAO, under the definition of sell, it includes conversion, etc. So he sells those rights and gets a cash transfer across to the other pension scheme. But he didn't have property or money in the cash underlying the personal pension scheme. What he had was those rights. And they transferred across to the options scheme. So he gets different rights. Now, either if he wants to get back money or other property, and it's not money, it will have to be property, money or other property paid or transferred, it would have to go back into the Friends Providence Scheme, which is not possible. But you can't do that. No. Uh, and uh, one has to assume that Parliament um, uh, intended something, uh, some meaning to be ascribed to this. Yes. Uh, on your construction, um, you can't put him back into the original pension provider, which I think we're all agreed, uh, and he doesn't get back money or other property paid because he doesn't have any money or other property paid because all he's got is rights. He has property. He has property paid. Well, then Section 2A is completely meaningless on your Well, in this particular context, it doesn't apply very well. To say the least. Well, it doesn't, fact, it doesn't apply at work. all, Mr. Moran. It doesn't work. No, it, it, it does right. not it work. work. So Parliament has produced a, a, a statutory remedy which makes no sense well, at all. Not, no, because if you turn to section 28, subsection 8, you get if property transferred under the agreement is passed to a third party, a reference in section 26 or 27 to or, or this section to that property is to be read as a reference to its value at the time of its transfer under the agreement. So what you're not doing is a restitutio and integrity. You're not getting back the property. You're getting back the value of the property. You're back into the compensation structure. But if you're right, there would be no pro property transferred under the agreement. There would never be any property transferred under the agreement. All that's transferred under the agreement are rights. But, but rights are property. Those rights under a pension scheme are property. Well, they wouldn't be passed to a third party. They couldn't be. Well, no, I accept that. But right, you can so, see from so section... subsection 8 doesn't make sense well, either. On. You can see from section 28 sub 8 that the statute, the legislature, is considering the possibility of what happens when you can't have a simple repayment structure. And that's not a problem for this. Because he's in, what he is entitled to recover is simply money or other property paid or transfer. If that cannot be done, it cannot be done. And compensation for any loss sustained by him as a result of having parted with. And that is capable of being done. 
So the legislature has not allowed a lacuna to develop here. Well, but, but ha has he parted with it, Quite. namely the money or other property, for the purposes of B, if he hasn't paid or transferred it for the purposes of A? Well, he has paid or transferred it. He's transferred it from Friends Provident. He's got right one, which has changed, and he's now got right two. He's transferred a right. So what's the problem with 2A then? Well, it's not, he, he can't get back the original right. That's the problem. So you're left with, how do you deal with what he has suffered? I see. It's not, we're not saying he can't get recovery, he can't get remedy. It's just the mechanism by which he gets the remedy. It's not a 27-2A, it's a 27-2B. Well, it would never be a 27-2A on your own. Correct. In this particular so 27, context. Well, it doesn't matter about the particular context with respect. You are never going to get a situation in which the original pension provider takes it back. Well, yes, but that's that's a prob that's a, a factual situation that applies to pension provision. It's not a problem with Section Twenty Seven per se. Usually, when you're talking about FISMA, you'll be thinking about people buying shares, handing over cash. In which case, a recovery of cash coming over <laughs> is simple. This is an unusual circumstance. Now, I'm just setting up the structure yeah. under which to analyse. How this works. It's, we are not saying he's not entitled to a remedy in any way, shape, or form. It's just how you assess the remedy and literally what this court has the jurisdiction to do. And the jurisdiction is, therefore, compensation for loss sustained as a result of having parted with it. And that means that all the fascinating analysis of all the common law cases of rest duty integral are literally irrelevant. It's not a question of rest duty integral, it's a question of what is the loss sustained by Mr. Adams as a result of having parted with his friend's provident pension rights. And then you get on to the... Well, just briefly, actually, also, there was a, a brief comment by Mr. McMeal about trying to describe this as having arisen out of the... Good report, uh, the pre-1986 action, uh, FSA, um, a Financial Services Act situa uh, report, and talking about the pre-Patel and Mirza illegality in allowing counterparties to seek rescission. Now, first of all, we are post-Patel. Secondly, our agreement is not illegal. That's why you need Section 27. The agreement with CLP might well have been illegal. Might have been illegal, but ours is perfectly legal. And thirdly, it is, as I come back to, literally the words of the statute. So how do you say you assess the compensation for loss sustained by him as a result of having parted with his rights to a friend's provident. So he had rights under the friend's provident, which were valued at, and, you, and their valuation assesses that entirely appropriately with what's called a money purchase or defined contribution pension. It assesses by reference to the underlying value of the, sorry, the value of the underlying asset. So he lost that, that was X. You then have the question of what he now has which is rights under the option SIP. And that takes account of the value of the store price. And here's the really basic point. Ignoring any question as to whether or not the court could order the store pods to be transferred out, which we say the court just can't. There's nothing in the statute that says that. Assuming that the court didn't order store pods to be transferred out, and say those store pods are worth £10,000, or £5,000, or £2,000, it doesn't matter what the value is. He still got that. So, say he transferred out £100,000 and he's got an asset worth £10,000 now, just for simplicity of numbers sake. It's not that he's lost £100,000. He's lost £90,000. It is a very simple word used in Section 27. Loss. Loss sustained. And if he has actually got an asset, out of this transaction that's worth this, then it has to be taken account of. And you can 
Stormforce makes it slightly unusual factually, but in, pr in principle it's identical to if he had used the money coming out of Friends Property from a with profits fund to buy into BT shares, and he's still entitled to those BT shares, it would be ridiculous to ignore the value of those BT shares, A, and B, deeply unjust. He would be making a windfall profit. Well, you know, he wouldn't make a windfall profit because he would be giving back the BT shares. Giving back the shares. I mean, you may say it would be wrong in terms of the statute, but he wouldn't be benefiting inappropriately. He he's returning the property received by him under the agreement. Again, which and is, this is again the which second is his problem. right under not, the under the new agreement. Yeah, and he's not doing that. And, no, and, and, and let's come on to that in one moment. But it, it is right, isn't it, that there's no windfall to him? Hmm. If if he handed, if somehow those store pods came out and ended up in our in our pocket, he would not be receiving a windfall. Well, you said but he ended, doesn't. Up, ended up in your pocket. They're your asset. They're not. They belong so to keep, the trustee. He keeps on saying that they're beneficially and legal, legally entitled. We're beneficially and legally entitled to the to the leases. This is rubbish. We are legally the title holder of those leases. They are beneficially held pursuant to the terms of the trust. This is absolutely basic trust law. When a trustee holds property pursuant to a trust, they are very specifically not beneficially entitled to that asset. That is literally the basis of it being a trust. So the fact that he doesn't have any direct equitable interest in a specific piece of property is irrelevant. It's, and in any trust, the trustees do not hold it beneficially for themselves. The beneficiaries have rights in relation to that, and they are valuable rights. Which they can give up. Well, um, surrendering a right under a, a, a trust can be possible, but you have to surrender your right. So who, who do you say is the beneficial owner of the pond? Beneficial owner? It's not quite as simple as saying simply beneficial owner. They are held pursuant to the trust, and the beneficiary is Mr. Adam. So, and I want to distinguish that, because if he was a, a beneficial owner simplicity, if this was a bare trust, he could call for the asset to be handed over. Yes. Well, I mean, he spent quite some time persuading yeah, yeah, yeah. us that he had no interest <laughs> in these store parts. Yeah. He doesn't have any direct interest in the actual specific asset. It doesn't mean that he doesn't have a beneficial interest pursuant to the trust. So we couldn't... Uh, look, the, the, the obvious test is this. Could we... Say those... It wasn't store parts. Say it was, again, £10,000 of shares in BT. Could we walk off with them? Obviously not. Unless he said you could. Pardon me? Unless he said you could. Uh, that would be a... Well, first of all, you'd have difficulty surrendering rights in relation to just one piece of property when there are also potential um, further beneficiaries, including unborns and dependents. Uh, it's not, my lady, it is not as simple as simply saying, I'm giving up my interest, you can walk off with it. You also have the dependents, and future interests, to take, the contingent interests to take account of. The second point, which I'll come back to on part 36, is if he was doing that for the purpose of a payment outside the pension scheme, that would be an unauthorised payment pursuant to the Finance Act. But that's a different point. Then you have the next point, which is when you think about what is being unenforced, you have and you look at the order at tab two of the bundle, page forty-four. And you'll see that pursuant to section twenty-seven of FISMA, the agreement entered into between the appellant and the respondent concerning the establishment and operation of the self-invested personal pension is unenforceable against the appellant and entitled to consequential relief. It doesn't say that the SIP is unenforceable. And there's a very specific reason for that, well, starting with what was declared in the judgment. You 
turning back, for example, to page tab one, page thirty-five, paragraphs one hundred four and one hundred five. The Lord Justice judgment. I've already said that I consider that the transfers out of Friends Life and into Carrie Sim were brought about by an arrangement undertaken by CLP. I likewise consider the transactions were in consequence of CLP's arrangement of the investments. And 105, the position is even clearer in relation to the advice on investments. The advice which CLP gave plainly played a crucial part in Mr. Adams deciding to transfer from Friends Life to Carrie. Now, there is, the, the SIP itself, and this is quite specific. The SIP itself is not an agreement between Mr. Adams and Option. It's a trust which was declared and settled between what was Kerry Pensions UK LLP and Kerry Pension Trustees UK Limited. And you can see that Sorry, to say it again, it's a trust which was settled. It was a trust which was settled between, or settled by, Carey Pensions UK LRP who's establishing operating and operating the pension, and settled upon and appoints Carey Pension Trustees UK Limited. And you can see that. In the opening passages and the recital to the trustees, tab 12, page 204. Recital, whereas. Page 204. Recital A, whereas Kerry Pensions UK is authorised by SSA to establish operation wind up a personal pension scheme, therefore within the persons who may establish a personal pension scheme, etc., and it wishes to establish such a scheme with effect on the date of C. B, Kerry Pensions UK LLP wishes to appoint itself a scheme administrator. C, Kerry Pensions UK LLP wishes to appoint Kerry Pension Trustees UK Limited, and so on and so on. And then it's agreed. The operative part of the deed. Carey Pensions UK hereby establishes under irrevocable trust a pension scheme to be known as the Carey Pension Scheme. And I think I've got this right. But there is a single Carey Pensions SIP trust of which Mr. Adams is a beneficiary. No, I think that was my understanding. Yeah. There is a single Carey Pensions, pensions Trust SIP trust. In fact, there are two. But for this oh, book, yes. There, there were two. There is a... In, as far as Mr. Adams is concerned, now there's one. And all the other people in this type of SIP so are also beneficiaries of this. Yes. Yeah. It's not void, it's not unenforceable, full stop. It's unenforceable. The agreement, which was to do with the transfer uh, and establishment, is void as, or sorry, not void, is unenforceable against Mr. Adams, but it doesn't mean that the trust ceases to exist. And if the statute has difficulty dealing with that, because it's an unusual set of circumstances, that's not a problem because it provides for compensation. And if it is difficult to get the um, recovery of property, again, there are going to be circumstances which the legislature must have recognised was a possibility. There are going to be circumstances where recovery of property is not possible for whatever circumstances or matrix reasons there are. But that is not a difficulty because, again, compensation can be provided. But all of that goes down to the simple question of how do you assess the compensation? And it's a very simple question. Any loss sustained? If you still got rights under carry SIP, probably option SIP, you take account of those. But then what happens to those rights? They carry on existing. Just well, for example, he still has but rights. That, on in what sense have you unwound the we're transaction? We're not. We're paying into the option SIP. They have agreed for the compensation to be paid into the option SIP. He still has these benefits. 
He's asked for a transfer, but to get a transfer, he has to have the benefits in the first place. Well, so that's, that's purely over. mechanism yeah. to make, sure, make it tax efficient. Yeah, that's... Yes, um, but Parliament, Parliament's intention is not that somebody who buys into a dud scheme should be foisted with the um, results of that. Um, Parliament's intention is to make sure that they're not out of pocket. Well, he... as, as discerned from the wording of the statute. But is, don't we have... I mean, the context in which this arises is going to be where it's been decided that someone... I can't remember whether it has to be a consumer to take advantage of this, but that they've been missold something and they're likely not to have understood the full detail of the product they were buying and that the person who sold it to them did and it's likely to be a very complicated financial instrument of some kind. And, and don't we have to read these provisions with that paradigm example in mind and construe the words in that context? You can construe the words to a degree with a purposive construction. But the words say you can re you've got provisions for recovery of money or other property paid or transferred to under the agreement and compensation for any loss sustained. That is the remedy that is available to this court. Right, but then if, if you're well, we, sticking it all under, under B, then mm. when you get to 28.7 mm -hmm. and 28.8, um, those are all seem to be referable entirely to uh, little a because they refer yeah. to recovering money paid or other property transferred. Yes. So you say that doesn't matter because if you're dealing with compensation, there's no need for well, first of all, restitution. That that can apply in certain circumstances, but in this particular case, it, it doesn't bind. Quite clearly, the language of restitution isn't to be. No, no, my lady, it's it's simply not. And you'll see at twenty eight seven, if the person against whom the agreement is unenforceable elects not to perform the agreement, then he's got to give back any money which was paid well, or transferred. How can he not perform the agreement? It's already been a transfer across from friends' providence. Well, I mean, the, it, A is an alternative to B, or. Yes. As a result of this, recovers money paid. All right, again, yeah, so can't gets, get it because it's not going back into friends' providence, it's staying in the option sip. Well, that's your point. If you're wrong about that, and we give it a purposive construction, what? Well, as a purposive, there's, there's a limit on what the purposive construction can do to assist interpretation of plain words. Can I just understand how it works in practice? So you say, once the court order is worked through, mm -hmm. you will be putting so much money in for the benefit of. Uh, Mr. Adams' SIP, and that will be supplemented by his rights in respect of the store pot. Yes. So the totality of what he's entitled to in the SIP is mm -hmm. cash plus store pot. Yep. Mr. Adams says very sensibly uh, he then wants to transfer into his uh, workplace pension. Um, so you then arrive at a transfer value, presumably. They just transfer it across. And you transfer it across. And how do you value the SIPA? Well, it um, depends on you if you're making an in species transfer or not. I can't quite believe that when <laughs> Canton is going to want the store bond. It it depends on it depends on the pension scheme. Yes. And if they don't accept the store pod, then you sell, convert into cash, and transfer that across. Yes. But it's still his rights under the option set. You still got to take account of it. If you're and by the way, if you're exercising a CTV, I'm pretty sure. Sorry, CTV, cash equivalent transfer valuation. It's rights under the pension schemes in 1993 to have a transfer from one pension scheme to another. No, I follow. And if you are exercising a CTV right, I'm pretty sure it has to be, a, if you want to say CTV, it has to be 100% of your pension. It may be that some pensions will allow partial transfers, but the CTV right would be a 100% transfer. So just pursuing that a moment longer. Um, So you get to the point where uh, Mr. Adams wants to transfer everything to Wing Canton. Um, and uh, the store pods have to be sold. Um, uh, 
if for the purposes of such a sale they weren't going to fetch two thousand five hundred and eighty pounds uh, because no one really wants them, uh, that would be something that would be appropriately taken into account in the compensation. Presumably. But if you could value it today, um, you take that into account in the compensation. But I mean, and it, in, in terms of actual marketability, does he need to be able to get them sold? No. Because otherwise, or find, a transfer in, or find a transfer in specie opportunity. Because there are schemes that will accept a transfer in specie. Well, he doesn't want that. He wants to put it into his workplace pension. So I, that's I, be practical. I, I accept that, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that is the only option that he has. And, that doesn't, and therefore, that doesn't mean that you, if, if, for example, he wanted to put it into a scheme that said, right, well, we'll accept an in specie transfer, but we'll take the value of the store. Say the stoppers were worth we knew ten thousand pounds. And say the, species, the new scheme said, we'll accept it, but we'll only value them at £3,000. That's not our problem. That's because how he wants to exercise unrelated rights thereafter. It depends. It, it, of course it depends. I mean, there are I'm, probably rather a lot of potential permutations yes. on this. Yes. Um, Look, all of these arguments I'm making, all of these submissions I'm making, really come down to one question. Do you take account of the store policy? Hmm. And here's a really, really simple point about it. My lady... My lady Rose said, d raised the question of how do you deal with the, tr if you were to, how would you deal with the transfer of the store pods? Two options. And the answer is, in terms of an order of this court, you can't. And by you, I mean your ladyships and lordships. There is no jurisdiction, there is no power. It's a pure monetary provision, which leads you inevitably back to the point which unless there is going to be a windfall issue as to the store pods, you have to account for them. Or whatever quantum it is, that's another matter. But you have to account for them. And the fact that this is a somewhat unusual situation because it's rights under pension scheme doesn't actually massively complicate it. In fact, yes, it doesn't seem to bother Voss any uh, that just left, it, left, left the store pods for options to deal with as they thought fit, which didn't seem to be a problem for them. Now, Foz if you can turn to that particular determination, specifically deals with that at paragraph 56, which is at page 124, tab 4. Which bundle? Uh, appeal, uh, this application bundle. The hearing bundle. The hearing bundle, sorry, yes. What page? Yes. Page 124. All that says, at the bottom, it's under paragraph 2, italic paragraph 2, take ownership of the store first investment. I understand Kerry has been able to take ownership of the store first investment for a nil consideration in other cases. It should do that here if possible, and if Kerry is unable to take ownership of the store first investment, it should remain in the SIP. Where are you reading? Sorry, page 124. It's in, if you have hole punches, oh, it right. would be just underneath the second hole punch. Italic heading to take ownership okay. of store first investment. The FOS decision doesn't provide for transfers of the store pods. And even if it did, and it's even if it had, the FOS jurisdiction and remedies available to it are very significantly different to this court's. I can get the sections for for this court, but in, in a nutshell. It deals with what happens, uh, sorry, the, the test for, uh, for FOS is not compensation. It is uh, such amount as the Ombudsman considers fair compensation for loss or damage, and the test for whether or not they should bite, and that's section 229. Section 228 of the FISMA says, a complaint is to be determined by reference to what is, in the opinion of the Ombudsman, fair and reasonable in all the circumstances. Just as a, uh, and this is very, very high level summary, uh, the reason I didn't put the statutes in is because it, it should be irrelevant to, to this court's decision. Um, FOS has a different jurisdiction of the court, and its determination of what is recoverable is significantly different and can cover things that this court can't do. This is by comparison to the jurisdiction of the pensions ombudsman, where the jurisdiction is for maladministration where although maladministration is wider than, say, negligence or breach of trust, uh, it does still have to follow the jurisdiction of the court in terms of remedies available to it. 
So the false jurisdiction is already different to this court and is not what is being provided for here. And the judgment that my learned friend referred to, or the determination, I should say, doesn't actually say what he says it says. It just said in some cases they've been able to take a transfer. So the value of this case as a test case going forward for all the various false cases that are to follow is pretty well nil. No, it's quite significant because it will determine the Section 27 Cobbs and potentially uh, um, conspiracy claims upon which and in the context of which FOS then makes its decision. So although FOS, um, in the intervening period between First Instance and Court of Appeal, FOS continued to find uh, against Kerry of an option, uh, it, was, it was finding it on a different basis. You also have different levels of jurisdiction, different quantum uh, issues, but it was significant. It also, as a test case, determined what the law was in these courts. There was something, as we're on this, I was a bit concerned by what you said in paragraph 19 of your case. Uh, it's something to the effect... Oh, um, um, well, we, ac we accept in this case that the loss includes lost investment returns, but note that it may well be in other cases that the loss should be calculated by reference to interest on the funds transferred. Oh, will, what that, does that mean? Actually? Well, that would cover situations where they were going to disinvest anyway. There's, uh, there's nothing particularly special in that. Mr. Adams wasn't, there's no indication Mr. Adams would have disinvested but for the transfer. What do you so he, he wouldn't have cashed in the without with the with profit. Oh, profit. I see. Kept it in a bank account as just cash. I see. Right. So, but for example, not in a saying situation where someone was going to do, was not going to invest in a with profit policy, was not going to invest in a particular fund, then you wouldn't get nominal investment returns there. It's it's a just a fact sensitive question. I, I, we're not trying to make any sort of particularly clever point. So, you say, well, in it's a matter of compensation. In calculating the compensation, you have to take account of the fact that Mr. Adams keeps the benefit of the store point. Yes. And I suspect you've developed your arguments on the principle, and unless you tell me otherwise. No, uh, in which case, it's a question of what figure on your case would be attributed to the store point. Yes. And when do we arrive at that figure? Is it now, or is it at the point at which... To be sold to um, well, when he wants to transfer the, the evidence on that income. is that we have a judgment in 2018 as to the value of those stores in 2018. In 2018, and the only other thing that's put forward is the valuations put for, forward on the annual return. And the problem with that is, and can I take you to tab six of the application bundle at page 165, which highlights all the problems. One six five. One six five. It's a letter of third of March, twenty sixteen. And this Sorry, really I've, I've also keeping up which page, but you were on one hundred and sixty five. Yes. And this really highlights the difficulties with any sort of valuation mm. being put forward by Kerry, which is they are specifically designed to be conservative, and they are not experts. And reading from the first substantial paragraph, please note. Oh, sorry. First paragraph, please find and close your own evaluation report. Uh, second paragraph, please note as a matter of policy, carry pensions uses a conservative valuation estimate for store first storage units of 50% of the original purchase prices in preparing SIP annual reports. This is for a number of reasons. Namely, carry pensions does not provide a formal market valuation of store first policy because it's not a qualified Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors surveyor and therefore is not an expert in the current market conditions for storage units. Goes on, Carry Pensions does not arrange for an annual RICS valuation to take place. And third bullet point, Carry Pensions recognise that you hold physical property and therefore a conservative estimate is more appropriate. This is a non-expert, deliberately conservative valuation going forward. Well, 170 looks a little bit more scientific than that. Mm. Pardon me? Page 170 looks a bit more scientific than that. Yes, but again, it's not on the basis of an expert RICS the basis of auction sales, whether or not they could be sold for more, 
identify a problem but there. The, the value of them for the pension fund is to generate income, isn't it? And we no, know that they just generated £91 over however many years he had them. No. Um, before you take your pension, the purpose of a, of a um, pension fund asset is capital appreciation, possibly by way of accumulation of income, but it's fundamentally capital appreciation. When you reach your pension date, you realise that capital appreciation. It may be there are certain circumstances in which it might be generating an income to pay a scheme pension, but not with a not with a SIP. It will be realise it and pay it out. Because that's capital appreciation, not income. Can I just break it down a moment? I mean, the depreciation. What what the judge found was the value in 2017 or something. Yeah, that's irrelevant. No, because we have to look at the compensation assess as of now, not the value of what it would have been in 2017. 2018, and no, it's, it, it, it's not irrelevant. It's a significant, properly assessed expert evidence. You mean it might be a guide to what the store yes. pods are worth now? Yes, and if you've but got that, that valuation... The, but that would be the only significance, wouldn't it? Because we're concerned with the value now. <coughs> so the question is whether a 2018 figure is a guide to what they're worth now. Yes, and if you look at page 167... And if there's a doubt about this, and we haven't got good evidence, one solution would be to say, well, let's put in so much by compensation now and then calculate the final figure based on what they're sold for. Yeah, you could do that by means of, a, uh, going back to my skeleton, uh, I suggested possibly a conditional or some. You could structure an order like and, that. And on the basis that Mr Adams is transferring to Wincanton, they have to be disposed of, and at that point we don't need to speculate as to what they're worth. We just have a mechanism under which what they're realised for is taken into account. I mean, hang on, let me work through that and just take a quick instruction, my lord. Apologies for turning no, it no, back. Sure, that's fine. instructions from the actual client as far as those my solicitors and I see that works and there shouldn't be a problem with that it's possible to do and I think we, we think and I have to say this is without double checking with the client yes. we think it's been done in the past so yes and I think no yes I mean that Sorry, would be fair. I was just saying I think repeatedly uh, um, it should be possible to structure that and put that within the context of an order it thereby takes account of the 27 to b issue about this being loss suffered. And it bites through the problem of the factual evidence being problematic here. Yeah. I would flag up that this isn't some sort of wriggly point by us trying to just avoid our own valuations. If you turn to page 167, yep. I, and this is more a, for credit rather than submissions, purpose, but 167, <coughs> you'll see in 2018 we valued them at 10,500, but you've got a determination that they were valued at 15,000 then. So there's obviously a disparity between what we were valuing and actual value. And the 2015, 2018 valuation in the court was based in part on sales. So this isn't just a, 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 a wriggle, on the, wriggle on this, we're avoiding, avoiding reality. There is, a, there is a genuine problem with the valuation ascribed. It is deliberately conservative. We've got people out there who are looking to their pension in the future. We are giving conservative valuations, which are, I would say, necessarily going to be on the lower end, at the very least. So but it's the, a flaw rather of, than a ceiling. The seat. value of them doesn't appear to be very stable. So one can't say, well, if they were worth that in 2018, they're probably worth roughly that now, because they, they do seem to have... They, they do fluctuate. There's one problem, which is there's not an enormous market in there is a market, but it's yeah. not enormous. Um, I happen to know, and I know this is evidence from the bar, I happen to know that a number of other pension schemes have got store pods of assets and have been selling over the past year and managed to sell over the past year. They're also receiving income sporadically, I grant you. Not necessarily this one, but they do sporadically receive income. So yes, I mean, there is a problem with market valuation, partly because of the market itself. I mean, as a matter of common sense, there must be some 
potential value attaching to these things there because is. the store parts can be let out. Yeah, there, there is, and they are sold. I mean, there is, as I say, there is a genuine market where people buy and sell them. It's not a very, it's not a very liquid market. Is one of the issues which results in a problem with with stability of the market price. How many of those sales are then rescinded later? We don't know. Well, I know that I know that some of them do go th again. Evidence from the bar. I know that they do go through because I see it happening with other pension schemes. Right. Yeah. So that really is the store bonds issue. That's the store bonds issue. And, and, and with it, the compensation issue. I think um, the only issue really remaining on the, on the compensation is the £4,000, which my learned friend very, very yes. sensibly accepted as an input rather but than... Wait, but work. how does that work, though, on your, on your um, basis? Because on your basis, when it's all compensation, um, section... 28 7 and the obligation to pay back any money he's received on the agreement if he recovers money paid or other property transferred you say he's not recovering money paid or tr property transferred so there's no obligation to repay on him mm -hmm. because 28 7 is just just doesn't arise so how, how then do you deal with the 4,000 pounds? That's a question of whether he lost anything. So it's not a 28-7, it's, it's a 27-2. He, di he didn't lose the 4,000 because he got the 4,000 and all that he actually lost was the 51. Yes. That's the a, way of looking at it. And B, if and to the extent that he did lose it, it's caused by getting it out his, himself rather than the transaction. Although I, I would say that A is the more accurate and yeah. the more correct way of construing it. Yeah. Um, so does that take us to the cost? That does take us to cost emissions. Right. So my lady Rose raised you know, what I think is probably the most intellectually interesting part of the cost emission, which is where does it say in part 36 that the offer has to be acceptable for it to be a part 36 offer? It doesn't. The difficulty is, if you can't accept it, how can it be an offer as a matter of language? When you say accept, you mean in a contractual sense? Yes. A, in a contractual sense. And B, even in a non-contractual sense. Because how do you accept something if there are other points to be agreed? Now, leaving aside whether or not that can, make a, that can give you a binding agreement, the problem in contract where you have an agreement to agree is that the parties are not ad item. And it's not a problem. It, it gives rise to the fact that it is not an enforceable agreement because there are other points to be determined. If, I mean, on that thesis, there might be, so to speak, a sliding scale. There would come a point at which there was too much outstanding. As, as with the test um, for whether or not it's But it wouldn't necessarily correlate with the contractual test. Not necessarily. But in this particular case, we do have one fundamental problem. Leaving aside... Milady, Justice Andrew's questions of um, <coughs> mechanics. Whether or not a normal situation you could get through the mechanics of it. What was being offered in this particular case required a payment by option to Mr. Adam in partly in consideration of the store pods coming out of the pension scheme. Now, because those store pods were held by options pursuant to the terms of the pension scheme, they did not have the power to do that. Leaving aside all the points about assignment and the lease and so on, they did not have the power to do that. <coughs> not an investment by the trustees, qua trustees, for the purpose of the pension scheme. It's a, effectively a gift by them, qua trustees, to themselves. And they are not beneficiaries under the pension scheme. And it is 
simply not appropriate. They are. The court should close its eyes to a breach of trust. Can't do it. FCA authorised <coughs> and regulated professional trustees, professional, I should say, professional pension scheme administrators and trustees, cannot breach the terms of trust in a manner that allows for them to settle claims by their beneficiaries. The, um, let's, let's approach, approach it as a matter of trust law. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Mr. Adams has claims on your pension scheme. Yes. Um, which he is willing to renounce. Uh, on the basis that you get an asset that was um, tied to him, I can't. Who's going? To, who's who's going to complain a breach of trust? <coughs> First of all, that's going to be the unborns and dependents potential potential claimants, future dependents. The I mean, there, there's an interrelation between this and the other point, which is your complaint that the money was to go to Mr. Adams. Yep. Um, I suppose you'd gone back and said, well, it can't go to Mr. Adams, it has to go into the SIP. Um, uh, the unborns get the benefit of what goes into the SIP. Yes. But they don't get the benefit of what comes out of the SIP. Um, but they, a deal has been done under which um, uh, more goes in. Because you're getting the um, no, no, no. Fill pod. Well, that, that's the, the, the. You may say it's expressed as two separate points, but that must be the reality. Um, that's not. That must be the reality. It's a very specific statement. Your client pays our client damages in the sum of sixty-three thousand. Not your client pays into the SIP sixty three thousand. It's your client pays our client. No, right. I follow that the, the, there's a problem with the money or potential problem with the money going to Mr. Adams first. Yeah. But suppose you've gone back and said, but we can't do that. The money has to go into the SIP. Would there then have been a problem with breach of trust? Okay. If you pay the money in and at the same time you take ownership of the store, store pods out, you still may have an issue there, although you could characterise it as buying the storage pod. But it's not actually a purchase and sale, which means it's not an exercise of investment power. It's the exercise of transferring storage pods out purportedly on the basis of investment and realisation of investment, but actually for the purpose of settling a claim against you personally, which means that it would be a fraud on the power. I have to say, I, seem, I doubt that. Yeah, so do I. All right. <coughs> so, first of all, we say it would be a fraud on the power. But, secondly, it doesn't matter. It's not what he offered. It doesn't bite. And the fact that he could have changed the offer to something else that does qualify doesn't matter. The ream of cases that deal with whether or not a Part 36 offer meets the statutory code has not a single jot about them saying, yeah, it kind of didn't meet the statutory code, but he could have corrected it the, so it bites. The tricky thing there is, as you say, there are lots of cases about failing to meet the statutory code, but this isn't a failure to meet the statutory code. But it, ha it has to be an offer, and an offer has to be acceptable has to be capable of being done. Otherwise, it's mere statement. If that happened, X, if X happened, then Y would happen. But it's not an offer, because it couldn't be accepted. The reality is um, that there has to be a means by which somebody in Mr. Adams' position, fairly in unsus unsophisticated individual, uh, is able to make a Part 36 offer to protect his position. All he's saying in general terms is, this is the amount of money I want by way of compensation. You can jolly well have the store pods. Now, at the end of the day, that's um, possibly how this case is going to pan out. He's got more money than that, or will have more money than that, and something can be done one way or the other about dealing with the store pods. It might be. This could be a without prejudice savings to cost offer, but it doesn't meet the requirements of the policy might be a part 44 factor to take into account, 
but it doesn't meet the requirements of Part 36, which are strict and black and white. For a good well, the trouble is they're not quite black and white enough. Well, no, I know. I accept that. Yeah, I mean, the, if I mean, they were, we wouldn't have thousands no. of authorities. I mean, the, start with. there is a list of certain requirements in 36.5, and on the face of it, they're all met. We disagree with that analysis. We say that 36.5 is not met because... There's this no is, offer. This, there's no offer. But even if we are wrong yeah. about that, <coughs> the fact that it couldn't have been accepted has to be taken into account in whether or not it, it would be just, etc. But do, doesn't the, doesn't the um, as I think Mr McNeil said, that there's, there is provision, as one might expect, in 36.8 for, uh, and in 36.9 for a bit of uh, and 36.10 even, for a bit of toing and froing between yes. the parties. Yes. Um, for both their benefits. Yes. Really. Um, but that's simply not what happened here. Mm. There wasn't a trigger for toing and froing, or this wasn't treated as a trigger for toing and froing. There was just a rejection of the offer. It wasn't quite as simple as a rejection of the offer. It was, and we'll come back to that in a short while, but it was turned down in the, in the, in the context of it being put forward. So what? If it's not a Part 36 offer, the fact that we didn't go back and to and fro and help them correct it doesn't adversely affect us. If they fail to meet the Part 36 requirements, we can let sleeping dogs lie. And it doesn't mean that the Part 36 statutory code suddenly ra rises up. It might be a factor to take into account under Part 44, but it doesn't mean that Part 36 is fine. So simply because Mr Adams uh, said, pay me the, the damages rather than pay it into my pension fund, it doesn't mean a Part 36. It can't be a Part 36 offer because it couldn't have been done. Well, suppose he'd said, um, this is the offer. I want compensation. I want my £55,000 back under 27 a or whatever it is, and I want 10% investment return in compensation, and you can have the store pods. Would that have been a Part 36 offer? My lady, it's quite difficult to get into a series of counterfactuals. And well, it, I can, yes, I can, see, I can the, see that the there would be a is, series of statements yeah. where at one end of the, of the spectrum it would not be a Part 36 offer, and at the other end it would be. Because if it got to the point where it said, uh, you will pay compensation of £65,000 into the SIP, and you can do what you like with the store pods, we don't care, that would be a Part 36 offer, because it could have been... But why do they have dealt. to say into the SIP? It, it, it would be... If, well, if, I've, if, I've, if, I've, if it was, you will pay me compensation of 65000 or you will pay compensation of £65,000, that would be all right. But if you had the word, you will pay me compensation, it wouldn't. I'm not, my lady, it, it's, it's not a case where I'm debating hypothetical what would have happened on other words. These words don't work. And of course you can invent situations where they're going to be grey, or situations where they're going to be black and white on one end of the spectrum or otherwise. It but just seems to me that it's, 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 it's uh, completely counterintuitive when the purpose of this is to encourage settlement. For the question whether it meets a Part 36 offer or not, to depend upon the mechanism by which the payment is effected to the person who is to be compensated. It, it does. So if make you sense. say, I, I, I want you to pay the money to me, it's not Part 36. If you say, I want the money to be paid into my pension fund, it is. And if you simply say, I want compensation, it probably is as well. And yet, that's how th Part 36 works. And the fact that it may be counterintuitive would meet dozens of cases where the fact that somebody has mentioned in interest or mentioned costs takes it outside of part 36. But there your problem is you don't meet the statutory requirement. Yeah. Yes. And if, you, if we are right about the fact that it has to be an offer which is capable of acceptance, then you don't meet the statutory requirement. And a part 36 offer is defined, oddly enough, the offer bit is not defined. No. So the court has to interpret. That. And if an offer is not capable of acceptance or capable of performance, it's not an offer in any sensible, meaningful way. Because if it was, 
If your lordship and ladyships were to find that that was possible, that really would be a can of worms being opened for other cases where Part 36 offers were made which were incapable of being accepted but mentioned a figure. Can I just see if I can clear one point out of the way? In the skeleton, it said that Mr. Adams didn't better the offer. He did, didn't he? No. As my learned friend said, you take your date of assessment as to whether or not they made it better or otherwise um, as at date of the offer. But it doesn't and make any difference. Ah. Okay, it depends on the value of the store pods. Because no, it doesn't, because you're keeping the store pods under the terms of the offer. No, so no, under the terms 000. of the offer. Suppose they're worth 100,000, fine, you, you get the 100,000, but it makes no difference to the fact that Mr. Um, Adams has beaten the offer. But he keeps the store pods now, that's the point. Uh, and if there were... Uh, so he has to take into account the value of the store pods and assess them. Well, if he gets to, to keep them, then uh, he's doing even better. Mm. Um, uh, so I, I just don't no, see... No, but we, but we don't get to keep them, so it's not a fair assessment. Well... It, what he said was, we'll t I'll take £63,000 and you keep the store pods. So he was, he was willing to take 63000 net of the store pods. Well, he's going to do better than that. I mean, however you look at it, he's uh, uh, going to end up with a, an overall... Sorry, um, sorry. <coughs> so assess... So his, his remedy is compensation. Yes. So back in 2016, what was he entitled? And there we see a um, uh, 70, 70 seventy thousand four hundred forty pounds. Okay. No, that's seventy thousand before you deduct the value of the store pods. No, but under the offer, he doesn't get doesn't the store pods. Doesn't get the store pods. So he's doing better. He's yes, getting but, seventy thousand. But 000. the judgment, if, if you if you get what he would would have received back in twenty sixteen, he wouldn't have got seventy thousand pounds. He would have got forty five thousand pounds. Sorry, it's fifty five thousand pounds. Well, he would have got. And that's how you assess whether or not he's he, done it he would have, on, on your basis, he would have got £55,000 plus store pods worth £15,000, therefore £70,000. He is offering to take £63,000 and not the store pods. So he is inevitably doing that's better. Off. He was willing to take just 63000 You say he's entitled to something, he was entitled to something worth 70000 might have been seventy thousand in cash, or it might have been fifty-five thousand in cash and fifteen thousand in store pods. But it's still seventy. But it's, okay, so put it another way, he's still fifty-five thousand in cash, rather than seventy thousand. But he was I, willing to let you keep this terribly valuable asset of the store pods. <laughs> um, so I, I just again, we couldn't have taken it. So he would have ended up with six hundred thousand and, and, and a store pods anyway. But what he was willing to take is inevitably less than what he's going to get. All right, if we go down that route, then it highlights the fact that we couldn't have accepted this on these terms. Yes, I see. So either we win because it's not actually capable of being done, or we win because he didn't beat it. Right. I don't think there's anything more I can say on that. No, I thought... <laughs> you, you've got my points, and we're I have to agree with them. It's another matter. Um, uh, very briefly, and this is almost a side note for your, for your notes, um, my learned friend said uh, this wouldn't be pension separation because he's over 55. In one sense, it wouldn't be pension separation. He's quite right about that. When you hit 55, you can take your pension benefit. Um, you, but when my learned friend said from 55 on, you can take all of your pension benefits in an untax-friendly fre way, it doesn't actually quite work like that. Uh, some schemes allow that. This scheme doesn't. Can explain why I don't think. It's I thought he said right. he could get twenty five percent. Sorry, twenty five percent tax free yes. cash and the then taxable seventy five percent, and then it's tax at forty percent mm. is the big yeah. deal. So you, even if your base rate is even if your tax rate is twenty five percent, you're still taxed at forty percent on the excess sum. You're quite right, Molly. Uh, but I, I can explain that if it's relevant. So, so just your punchline is we could have got it right. It's not merely that Mr. Adams could have taken. Uh, all the money and borne an adverse tax rate. Yeah. Under the terms of this scheme, he couldn't have taken the money. Could right. actually, it. does that work if what he's getting is compensation? Well, if it was coming out, of the, this is really coming back to whether or not this would be pension, pensions liberation by the back door. It wouldn't be pensions liberation in the sense of uh, 
a blind eye to the HMRC. It would be, it used to be called trust busting sometimes. It would be a breach of trust is what I'm really saying. That doesn't sound so convincing. No. Because uh, <sighs> after all, the whole purpose is to settle a, a genuine bona fide claim that's been brought in court um, by means of, uh, of a, a mechanism for doing that. It would be extraordinary if that yeah. um, now, turned out to be a breach of trust. If this was done by way of compensation, this was a court ordered by way of compensation and for whatever reason it ended up going into his hands, there might be arguments as to whether or not that was going to be subject to tax. Yeah. If it wasn't subject to tax, there would be significant problems because it would be a way around the tax regime. If we were handing it out, it would be a compromise agreement, particularly if we got the store pod, it would be a compromise agreement whereby Mr. Adams received benefits utilizing indirectly assets under a registered pension scheme, and that would be deemed to be an unauthorized payment. So the, what would the consequence of that be? I mean, we, it, what the matters right to Bussey's point of view is that they get tax. tax. But from our point of view, is, again, we can't do that. We can't make unauthorized payments like that. Yes. I mean, tax-wise, pay the tax, but we just well, can't. Well, be open to the parties to come to the court and say, well, um, we want to deal with this in a way which is legal. Um, we've agreed that this is the amount of compensation that should be paid under Section 27B, you would say. Uh, and these are the consequences, and then the court could sanction the order. The court could make a judgment. You could do a short-form trial when nobody opposed it. Yeah. But it would still be a judgment rather than a yeah. simple compromise. I can see that, but it, it wouldn't be... a judgment be pursuant to the fact that the parties had agreed terms. Had agreed terms and agreed quantum. You'd have to, it would have to be an exercise of the court's discretion under sections 27 and 28. So it wouldn't be a... It couldn't be a rubber stamp. Those are the words I was going to use. It couldn't be a rubber stamp, but it would still be a determination by the court. Yeah. So, with that in mind, we then have... If I'm wrong about this not being part 36 offer, then we end with the neck. The last question is, is it unjust to impose the normal consequences on the costs and with the uh, sorry, um, is it unjust to impose the normal costs and interest uh, consequences on uh, sorry, interest and cost consequences for post relevant period? And of course, uh, I have no doubt we are A, your, this course is very familiar with uh, the provisions of part 36.17 and B, certainly today, uh, and it's 36.17 sub 5, which if in the current white book is page 1290, in considering whether it would be unjust to make the orders referred to in paragraphs 3 and 4, the court must take into account all of the circumstances of the case, including terms of only part 36 offer, and we would say the terms takes into account whether or not it could be accepted. That's A. B, the stage of proceedings where it was made, including in particular how long before trial the, start, the offer was made. C, the information available to the parties at the time when the part 36 offer was made. And D, the conduct of the parties with regard to the giving of or refusal to give information for the purposes of enabling the offer to be made or evaluated. And it's C and D which addresses my Lord Justice Newey's point, which is that when we said we don't know what your quantum is, that's not information or clarification concerning the Part 36 offer. It's information or clarification concerning the information available to the parties and give information for the purposes of enabling the offer to be made or evaluated. And that gives rise to Application bundle, tab 11, page 202, our response. The 
really relevant paragraph is that third paragraph starting notwithstanding. Notwithstanding the valid arguments which our client has in relation to liability, said our witness defence, our client cannot properly consider the offer at the present time as your client has failed to quantify his loss. The figures of the claim simply state that Mr Adams is entitled to the return of the fund value of his PPP together with compensation representing the returns which the said fund would have earned but for the inception of the SIP. Full particulars will be provided in the form of a schedule of loss hereafter. Our client cannot properly consider the offer without a schedule of loss. Please provide it by return. We also request a breakdown of the offer. Now, I admit that that last sentence is somewhat ambiguous, breakdown of the offer, but I would say that's a breakdown of what amounts to uh, compensation and what amounts to return. Same difference. So long as you give us a schedule of loss is the important point. Well, you know how much went in. We know how much went in. And then your ladyship raised a question of you can calculate by, rate, by relevance to interest. You can't if they are claiming compensation for return. Yeah. It's not an interest claim. So it doesn't matter to us. The moment that they're claiming compensation for return, they are not claiming interest. So all we know is an amount came out. We don't know how it was invested. Well, we don't know how it was invested. We don't know what it would have been. And we didn't get that until five... We didn't have five... information about Friends Provident or which funds it was in. I think we had the information about Friends Provident, but not which funds it was in. I think oh, you must have known it was Friends fund. Provident, yes. because they were... They yeah, yeah, no, it, it, we knew that it was from Friends funds. Provident, yes. but we didn't know funds, funds. All you get when you get a transfer is how much is it, and you get the cash, you get yeah. a cheque, basically, yeah. or electronic transfer. Now, that's in uh, 7th of April 2016. We don't get a schedule of loss, despite there being an order for we don't get a loss, schedule of loss until a week before trial. So, by which time it was updated as well. So it was literally impossible for us to assess by reference to what the actual loss being claimed was. Now, it might be that the explanation for that is that a few months later, by October, everybody had agreed this was going to go forward as a test case. It was originally in the county court. It moved up to the high court, specifically as a test case. And it may well be that it can be explained from, from that that the claimant thought, we're not too particularly concerned about the amount of money on this. This is a matter of principle, so we won't go down the precise pound shillings and pence issue. Which would be sensible, because this is a, in, in 2016, it's a 16, 60 to 70,000 pound claim at its top. And we end up being put forward with cost budgets of 260 to 320,000 pounds, which could not have been approved by the court if this were not in, in, in very much, as a matter of substance, a test case. If this was down in the count, central London County Court for a 60,000 pound or even a 100,000 pound claim, if I turned up in front of his honour Judge Dyke and said 300,000 pounds cost budget, I'd be laughed out of court. And that's quite significant. Because A, it explains why it stopped being a relevant issue and why there was no explanation or could not have been understood. And B, it goes to a further point as to whether or not it is just or unjust to, to impose the full Part 36 implication. Because by October, this was not a standard commercial claim. This was, and it was not as simple as Mr. Adams is going to win or lose on 50 to 100,000 pounds. It was a question of principle. Now, I can see some sort of hybrid cost order which takes adverse cost consequences between April and October 2016. I don't think there'd be an enormous amount of tearing that time. There was a CMC, basically. And that might be a valid way of reflecting that period of time when it wasn't accepted. But by the time everybody had said, we're going to use this as a test case, we're going to plough on with this, no one wanted it to be. Including, and wouldn't it still be a test case if it's settled? If you settled no. this for sort of X percent above what he no. had got, doesn't um, buy then you could go to all these other people and say, "Well, this is what this person accepted. This is what we're offering you. Go away." Well, I suppose, in one sense, it could be an example of a settlement figure that we've done. Yeah. But in reality, it's not a test case in the sense of getting a binding determination that we can apply in court. Or you could pick another test case instead. We could have picked another test case, yes. But this was a this was the test case that was picked, including by the claimant and his legal team. 
So the moment it becomes a test case, it changes the background in which the context of whether or not to accept or decline or, or a, a Part 36 offer arises, number one. And number two, and this is the really important point in terms of justice, number two, if you are proceeding with this as a test case, it is a different costs. I, I, I don't want to use the word regime. It's a different cost context. Rather than spending hundred thousand pounds, you spend three hundred thousand pounds. And if you have agreed that this is a test case, you've agreed to its transfer to the High Court specifically for that purpose. You cannot come back later and go, you know what? While it wasn't a test case, we made this offer, and we're going to have all the penalties incurred by it because we agreed to this going forward as a test case. And when we highlighted this question of how on earth do you assess this, and our friend Mr. McMill said, uh, this was a case, not every I was dotted and T crossed. Uh, no I's were dotted, no T's were crossed. It was a simple question, how do you assess it? No answer was forthcoming at all. And then it's in that context also of a test case, which is whilst, obviously, there's a, and I, I fully accept that in Part 36, the standard question of whether or not you've beaten or, or, or not beaten just comes down to, did you make it, did you make the difference by a penny? Fine. And as such, identifying the three heads of claim doesn't raise a question of whether or not they've beaten Part 36. But it does raise the issue of justice. Because it's not a simple question of us having lost the claim and therefore having to pay over. We have won something substantially important as a matter of, I, I don't want, well, I do want to say it's a matter of principle, but a matter of principle that has real world application. It is of value to us. Uh, the very last point I want to just very quickly cover is the interest rate, if it is a Part 36, and if the court considers it that it is not unjust to impose the adverse consequences. The question of interest rate, uh, Malone Fenn made a concession, 2% above base rate. We don't have instructions, but I would find it difficult it to oppose that. It doesn't sound an unreasonable figure if we it's, get that It's far. difficult to oppose that. Can I just leave yes. it at that? I'm not positively agreeing with it because I don't have instructions. Yes. Double check I haven't missed anything. Oh, yes. Uh, there's one last practical point um, in relation not just to the cost, but specifically in relation to the payment uh, of compensation. Um, as I think this court may be aware, we've made an application for permission to appeal to the Supreme Court. We, we made it within the time, that we're still waiting. Uh, perfectly understandable, but it takes these, these things take a little bit of time. We have a concern. Whatever compensation is ordered, paying it into the SIP is fine. Getting it back out if it turns out that we get permission to appeal, will be problematic. Particularly, not, now if it was just sitting there with us, we could probably work out a way of getting it out because it would be under a mistake, or, or you could get an order from the court back out. That's fine, but if there's a transfer to another person's pension scheme, we have a problem. So, um, some sort of mechanism for providing that that doesn't happen before permission has been either accepted or denied by the Supreme Court would be, we would say, essential for practical fairness in this particular context. It, it's essentially we're asking for a stay of enforcement until that particular issue is dealt with. Uh, if somebody has practical suggestions as to how to make sure that there's no adverse consequences of that, we'd be very open to discussing it, but we, we've scratched uh, our heads in contact. Just thinking around that, I mean, I'm not sure I beg to raise my name, but uh, I can imagine it might take a little while for the Supreme Court to make up its mind. Um, and we would, on this thesis, have fixed the amount of compensation yes. now. Yes. Um, so you could accrue. We'd be perfectly happy to have interest accruing 
in the intervening period of time. Yes, That's okay. obviously appropriate. Well, but the trouble is that, the, um, as my Lord says, will you be looking at the amount of compensation now based on what the Friends Provident Fund would have earned uh, at the date of our judgment? Suppose that the Supreme Court were to give permission and to uphold our decision, um, the amount of compensation that would be due at that stage would be a lot more, wouldn't it? Uh, I, I, if it wasn't paid over. If it wasn't paid over. I, we, we're perfectly happy to put, put in mechanisms to make sure that Mr Adams is not out of pocket if he manages to uphold the decision. Yeah. Well, our concern is making sure that it's recoverable by us if we, well, if why we win. Is, why is that your concern? You're not bothered about his £60,000 or £70,000. If you want to take this to the Supreme Court because of your own um, interests, isn't it more normal in these sorts of cases that you say, actually, the result won't affect him adversely either way, win or lose, that he gets his remedy, we want to fight this for our own reasons, that shouldn't affect him? Isn't that what um, usually happens in these circumstances? Have Why do you I, have to claw it back from him? Well, I, I'd have to say I don't know, I haven't done that many applications for permission to appeal to the Supreme Court. Um, I haven't done any hearings in the Supreme Court, but in principle, suppose we were to win, we'd be entitled to get back whatever we'd paid in. Um, the difficulty would be recovering it, and it wouldn't work that we could, we wouldn't be going against Mr. Adams himself personally. I mean, for one thing, I'm likely to work. I have a suspicion you would be able to get the money back. I. <laughs> Well, Possibly, but, it, but transfers back out. Once you've had a transfer into a pension scheme, it's really difficult but to if, get if back you out, even if there's a mistake. But if you said the Wynne Canton scheme, you only agreed to transfer the money on the strength of this Court of Appeal decision uh, and there was an order, uh, that order has now been overturned. I'd have to, I'm not sure about the mechanics, but I have a feeling you'd get the money back. Might do. I have to say, I think it, it, it is surprisingly difficult to get money back out of a registered pension scheme once, once it's been transferred across on a prima facie valid transfer. Um, after that, it's a question of whether or not this is actually a valid payment that can be made by the tra pension scheme. Uh, it, it does become complicated. It may be. I'm not saying it isn't possible, my lord, yeah. but it is difficult and yeah. may not be possible. And we're not going to be going after... well. Even if one went after Mr. Adams, one, could, one would be concerned about penalty. So I raise this as a question of stay of execution pending, at the very least, determination of permission. If we don't get permission, it's going to be straightforward. If we do get permission, it may well be a little bit easier to, understand, to determine as to whether or not the payment should be made now or, wait, or, or thereafter. So it might be a relatively short... Well, I, say relatively, I don't know how long... I have a suspicion the Supreme Court, Lady Rosemary, won't be deciding these things over the long vacation. Now I, I would be well yes but the long vacation is, a, is coming who knows how many judgments will be handed out before the, the end of July that does tend to be uh, a cluster of them but it's a problem anyway so I've highlighted this uh, I have no doubt your, this court will take that into account when considering relief yeah are there any other points that I can assist this court? I think that's oh, another good for you. oh yeah I've also got a ha, ha, good point coming up from those sitting behind me Mr Adams could withdraw it he gets his pension, transfers it across to Wincanton and takes a transfer out and just takes a cash on it, it, On that basis, it would just be the risk that anybody years. runs when uh, they've paid money over to the victor and um, uh, there's a further appeal. Mm. I recognise that, but it's slightly different in this particular context in that we know that we're, you know, we're talking about somebody who's not a fantastic claim against this in a context where it's a payment into a pension scheme. Mm. But it's it's a matter of discretion of the court at this stage. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. No further questions? No, not for me anyway. Thank you, Mr. Sandy. Mr. Smith. Mr. McMill. My Lord, I'm conscious it's about three minutes to one. Well, uh, unless uh, Lady Rose, Lady Mr. Sandridge disagree, I'm inclined just to press on yes. in the hope that we won't be that long in reply. I, I wasn't expecting to be that, that long in reply. Um, I think I, I, we can be finished by five past or ten past, I think, yes. realistically. Um, I don't know if, if, if your Lord and Lady are planning to extemporise or whether it will be... No, also... no. You, you will get another written judgment. Um, we would hope this time that there won't be a need for further oral hearing to deal with matters arising from it. 
Yes, yes. Well, I, I think I can take it quite, quite quickly. We've, we've ranged far and wide since I sat down. Um, and I would simply say on the, the principal point um, that the court should take itself back to the legislation. And um, we, in my submission, traveled a long way away from the language of, of section 27 and 28 in the course of my friend's submissions. And we just go back to the point. Whilst it's not entirely clear in a, in a construction of sections 26 to 28, there is an election. Um, it comes out slightly indirectly, but the election is, do we uh, enforce this agreement uh, or do I seek to set it aside? Do I seek to uh, recover money or property with compensation? Uh, and we say an election has been made uh, by the particulars of claim of the very latest to uh, set aside the SIP. And, and we can go back to the judgment, but th there was some debate about the relationship. Obviously, the trust, uh, as my own friend says, it is a relationship technically between two companies in, in the options group. Um, th there is some kind of contractual participation in my submission on options own terms and conditions, at the very least, for example, to pay the annual fee uh, for the services of the respondent company uh, as the administrator. This is a professional trustee relationship. There is uh, an agreement, uh, and that's what we're setting aside. We're not, we're not trying to invalidate the trust that affects other members. So to the extent that there is an agreement, including a right to participate in the trust, in the trust assets, uh, Mr. Adams opts, elects to, to set that aside, which deals with the point that learned friends' submissions all are premised on the SIP having a kind of a half-life. Now, we're, we're accepting for the purposes of relief that it will have a, a temporary shell tax structure life, uh, but that's a, a side deal we've done. But the, the, the strict court order is the SIP is unenforceable against him, except to this extent that it's a useful... Uh, so as long as the money stays in the SIP, is this annual fee of the administrator deducted from the, yes. the benefit? That, 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 that all comes back through the reconstruction of the SIP, through the, the restitution and compensation. So you, if you look at the valuations, it had gone down to threepence, I think, because the annual fee had, 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 had worked through the cash quite quickly by about 2016. So the, the, the cash amount, there's probably an outstanding notional annual fee payable to Mr. Adams that is wiped out by, by this judgment. So, so we say you've got to go back to the election, um, say for the purposes of it being a tax vehicle for, for, the, for the outcome of reach. The SIP is no longer enforceable. And we say, again, you go back to day one, the SIP, I think, is created in April 2012, and it's not until the second half of the year that the store pods are purchased. And I go back to my first submissions. Every step taken, including the purchase of the store pods by the trustee company, as at least the legal owner of the store pods, is simply part of that unenforceable arrangement that the court puts aside. When my learner's when the friend was, was submitting on the amount of compensation, uh, we do agree the figure is the ninety-two thousand odd figure I started with. Um, the store pods will need to be sold by by the respondent, um, and they've been able to sell them in other cases. We're told, uh, and that sum will help fund fund the compensation. We said that's entirely an internal matter for the respondent. It's a, a way in which this court's order under section 27 and 28 is given effect to, but it's, it's not to do with us. So how, how much they get for those store pods is a matter for them, uh, as far as the, the main order is concerned. Uh, and we, we do say that um, the Ombudsman's determination does suggest that in, in other cases that they've been able to either hand them back to store first or else uh, obtain either a, a nil consideration or some consideration for them. It's really not our concern because the language of section 27 and 28 is that all those steps taken to acquire these store pods, to rent them out very, very unsuccessfully, are simply unenforceable against Mr. Adams. That is the statutory outcome. Well, so that, that's certainly the aim. Um, Mr. Moran's point is that if you look at the language of 27 and 2A, you simply cannot recover the rights that were transferred under the agreement because the rights that were transferred under the agreement were the rights to uh, participate in the Friends Provident, um, and they can't go back to the original pension provider. So 
his point is that 272A doesn't bite at all, and if, therefore you're into the compensation territory. Well, I mean, I'm not sure I, I, I accept that, because um, there's no reason why um, Mr. Adams couldn't transfer it back to Aviva as it now is, um, and, and, and well, buy they'd into they'd it. They'd never take it back. I mean, that, well, we've, got to be we've got to be realistic about it. Well, my learned, my learned friend used the phrase cash equivalent transfer value, and it, the, the main core of pensions freedom under the, the legislation is that whatever pension rights you have can be converted into cash uh, and move between pensions. So what, what does move across? Well, he might be able to pr procure it, but we wouldn't. the point that, that Mr. Moran is making is that we wouldn't be able to order that. Well, I, th I think, in, in my suspicion, he's wrong because what, what comes into the SIP in, in April 2012 is a cash sum, and all we're asking the court to do is to look at that cash sum, which is the, the, the product of rights against the life insurance company, yeah. and treat that as a sum which is the unjust enrichment. So it's... It, I'm not convincing at the common sense or the indeed the... the that that seems to be the, what the statute has in mind. It's just the language of the statute um, doesn't necessarily enable the court to do that. Well, let me, let me, let's, let's, let's look it up and just so I can help if I can assist with your issues. Now, in my submission, pensions legislation is entirely on our side because it, it recognises that the core of, of pensions freedom, which is legitimate pensions freedom, is, is the right to always seek a cash equivalent transfer value. The agreement is made by somebody in contravention of the statute, and the agreement therefore becomes unenforceable at the behest of Mr. Adams. Yes. So you say that includes the whole of the SIP agreement, including any trust which is an adjunct to it or a necessary part of it. What is that for? What he gives, what he, his obligations under the SIP are to pay fees, yeah. and in fact. Turns out there are business rents and other expenses, and business rates and other expenses in this one. Those are not enforceable against him. Yes. He gives up as part of his his ob obligation to make counter restitution, his right to participate in trust assets, trust 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 benefits. Just turning it around. So the, the, the restitution. So a Millen friend talked about my seeking restitution in integral. No, what I'm giving is restitution integral. I'm giving counter restitution under section twenty seven eight. Just turning it around a moment, leave aside the um, technicalities of the legislation. If one had an outcome under which there was paid into the SIP a sum of money, they'll say as compensation, uh, and ultimately uh, you gave credit for whatever sum the store pods were sold for uh, in the context of a transfer to Wincanton, that would be perfectly fair. Wouldn't it? It, if, if the target is the is, is the figure we're talking about, which is the ninety two thousand pounds as the overall compensation, uh, how that's funded internally by the respondent, I'm, I'm not concerned about. But and, and, and a way of doing it, which you are concerned about, is saying, uh, in, in however it's done as a matter of mechanics, um, the SIP is counted. As, credit to you, the store pods are counted as a credit to you, but the value for which you have to give credit is fixed by what they're sold for. Yes, and, but, but if the target end compensation figure is the £92,000, yeah. it's, it's, if they're worth zero, they're worth zero, if they're worth £100,000, it's actually a windfall to the respondent. It's, it, it, it doesn't matter. <coughs> it, it, it would if we adopted the sort of mechanism I was airing with Mr. Moran, mm. under which you didn't get your final payment until the store pods have been sold. Well, my, sim my simple answer to that is, you know, where is the statutory basis for that mechanism? The, 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 we have three well, it lies in the, it, <coughs> it lies. the answer to that is it lies in the word compensation, because on Mr. Moran's basis of, of looking at the statute, he says, well, you're, you're being, you're, your loss has got to be netted off against your gains, and you're all looking at the SIP. Uh, and so um, uh, what you have within the SIP, which is still working, um, is the comp is the compensation element of the ninety thousand pounds plus, or at plus the store pods, which are whatever worth whatever they're worth? Uh, and so my lord is postulating that if they're worth zero, then at the time when it's all transferred off to Wincanton, then um, nothing is netted off. But if they were worth twenty thousand pounds or something like that, then um, that would that would come out. 
a sort of counting exercise. It, it, it's it's going to have to be done, but I, I don't think it's strictly what's being done under the, the, the Act. Well, your, po your, your point, though, is a slightly different one, which is that you just ignore the stalk pods and leave them where they are, um, uh, because as part of the restitutionary process, they stay as uh, an asset for the benefit of whom, whomsoever might still be subject to the trust, the, these postulated dis dis descendants or unborns. Um, and um, what you just get is the 92,000, which goes in and out. I'm not sure there's any economic difference no. between your position and Mr. Moran's no, 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 as no, now. No, it's, it's, it's the legal difference. It's, it's, uh, yes. No, but it's, the, the point is, is that my submission on that is, is simply that we are entitled to both restitution and compensation, but then, then friend is trying to box you into a, an area in which it's only compensation. The restitution is quite clearly, in my submission, on, on the language of Section 27.2, um, my primary submission is that the cash equivalent transfer value from the life insurer falls yeah. quite naturally within the language of yeah. Section 27.2. And in any event, a, a common sense or purposive construction would, would, would catch it. I mean, to the extent that cash exists anymore uh, in an economy in which most money is bank money, um, the telegraphic transfer re 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 um, received by the respondent is a cash equivalent transfer value. I, I find that the most natural reading of, of Section 27.2. So we say we're both in 27.2a, uh, the transfer value, and b, the loss of investment. So we say it's as simple as that. So we yep. don't get into the. Um, but if you're right about that, then it naturally flows from 27, um, uh, sorry, 28, 7, and 8, that you must be right about the count of A then. That's right. So it all really turns on the construction of 27A. Yeah. Yep. And, and, and we, we say either natural and ordinary language or even a, a common sense approach to this. And it's, the pensions context is not a highly specialist area of, of uh, investment. It's the main way in which the, the average person in this country participates in the investment sector. So it's not an esoteric area. Obviously, there's tax legislation and pensions legislation. Uh, but the Financial Services and Markets Act is there to pr protect uh, investors in this context. And why would Parliament not wish to include cash equivalent there, transfer values? There are pl plenty of other kinds of investment other than pensions, where what the person has is actually right to a a fund in which lots of other people are participating as well. Well, it, 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 works, it works in four steps, lady, doesn't it? So it works in the step that what, what Mr. Adams had before he decided to transfer from um, the life insurer is a contractually based investment mm -hmm. of very indirect right to participate in the funds maintained by the insurer. He decided to take a cash equivalent sum. So there's a point at time in which mm -hmm. those rights are swapped into a cash equivalent sum. They arrive with the respondent as a cash equivalent sum. And that is the point at which the statute makes any further steps by the respondent unenforceable against him. So that's the point of time. So the store pods come much later, months later in the story, in terms of actual purchase. So we say uh, the FISMA does work here, uh, clearly as a matter of language and policy, uh, to protect Mr. Adams and to have the accumulation of the three remedies, unenforceability from day one, restitution of the cash equivalent transfer value, and uh, consequential compensation. That's my case on this. It's it's a matter of a statutory res rescission mechanism that makes perfect sense. Uh, the store pods are the respondent's problem. Simple as that. Um, turning to Part 36, there is no test case exception to Part 36. Um, that was the the gist of my and friends' submissions. Um, Yes, this went forward as a test case. At one point in the friend's submissions, he says, well, it's OK to make an adverse cost order in favor of the respondent for the trial below because he's got AT insurance. I mean, in what way could any private individual have even <coughs> contemplated being in the high court or in this court uh, without, such, without such protection, maybe before the events insurance is the only other option one can think of? So that's a, a strange way of looking at um, the financing of this. Um, the costs on the respondent side have been much more significant uh, and they wanted an increase in the cost budget before the judge which they didn't get for, for two silks um, it, it, it should not be the case and there's no reason why an individual who's selected as a test case cannot still take advantage of part 36 um, test cases are desirable uh, but it may be that test cases emerge from a number of hundreds or potentially thousands in some cases of potential factual scenarios and 
I, I go back long enough, I think, Mr. Moran, as well, to the pensions of selling of the 1990s, in which every test case I selected was settled very rapidly by the life insurers. <laughs> I put forward in, on, on many I think occasions. The, the real thrust of the argument, though, is that um, six months before, there's an, there's an offer on the table which, according to Mr. Moran, is not capable of acceptance, but let's assume it is. Um, and that, uh, the consequences of not accepting that offer are that you are exposed to costs of a county court action. Um, what then happens is six months down the line, uh, either expectedly or unexpectedly, the parties agree that it should turn into a test case with all the cost consequences that are added to that, which then exposes the person who's had the opportunity to um, pick up the offer um, to a much, much greater extent of costs and what he basically says is it's unfair to visit all the part 36 consequences uh, of that when um, if you like the, the case is being fought for the greater good and it was inevitable that the costs were going to be that much greater it couldn't have been foreseen at the time of the offer well, I'm, I'm grateful I'm not sure you put it quite like that but that, that, that's a very uh, useful way of putting it um, but we still say that that, that, that is uh, the case um, cases turn to test cases. We, we, we all know that in this court and the Supreme Court, things take on a life of their own. But in my submission, that, that is not a reason in the ordinary course of events to, to disapply the, the Part 36 regime. And the, uh, it may well be that in many situations, um, claimants should have claimants who are necessarily supported by uh, uh, AT insurance and so on may not wish to be on that particular juggernaut for, for, for the period going forward. And to take away the right under the CPR uh, of Mr. Adams to put in an offer to protect himself about the, against the adverse costs of what he's got into uh, is, to my, is my submission unjust. Um, he always had in our submission a Part 36 offer that looks like it complies to me with 36.5. Uh, we say it was an offer pretty clear offer, in, in whether it's a matter of contract law or, or some CPR autonomous version of, of offer, which is that I want this sum, £63,000 odd, you have the store pods, this is an offer. That looks like an offer in my submission. We say it's capable of acceptance. Um, nothing in the, the finance legislation or the pensions legislation or a trustee can override a claim brought under the Financial Services and Markets Act, a piece of primary legislation saying these are your rights if you end up in an investment contract as a result of dealing through an unauthorized intermediary. A court order uh, of this court says that those are your rights. Those are the, the rights which the finance legislation, the pensions legislation, the trustee must accommodate to in my submission. So it was capable of acceptance. It was capable of some toing and throwing if necessary. Uh, but I don't think it actually got that far. It, in terms of a straightforward offer to compromise this litigation, which was taking on a life of its own. Mr. Adams was entitled in the Part 36 to put this forward. Uh, you know, and obviously he has arrangements with his ins insurers um, to know that at least we've put in an offer which is about 10% less than a good day out if we get home under Section 27. That's what he's done. Um, that is exactly what Part 36 is about in my submission. So my own friend doesn't get close to, to scaling the formidable obstacle of, of getting out of Part 36. He didn't go on to address Part 44. I mean, he's done it in his written submissions. But uh, even if your lordships are against me, this is a case in which most of the cost consequences under Part 36, I think, will be available to your lordship and ladyships under Part 44. Because if it's not a, a Part 36, it's, it's as close as one could possibly wish to a Part 36. And I'd certainly be looking for my indemnity costs. Uh, even under Part 44 on that basis for the whole action because the offer was an appropriate offer to put in place at a stage when this litigation was getting serious. Um, a private individual, Mr. Varan, spent a long time at the end worrying about where the money might go in a stay. Um, this is not somebody who really uh, can contemplate with equanimity having uh, cost budgets of over half a million pounds. So to take away that protection from him, in my submission, would be unjust. Those are my submissions on, on part 36. Uh, Check. Sorry. Yeah. So that, that's, that's our, our point of the point of principle. Yeah, just 
check if anybody has anything else. No. Uh, in which case, uh, thank you both very much. Um, you will be provided with a draft judgment for typographical and similar corrections, but not to uh, re-argue the case. Uh, we would be grateful if at that point you would seek to agree uh, an order giving effect to uh, what we decide. If there are points of difference, can you please provide brief written submissions? And we would expect to determine those points in writing without any further oral hearing. Uh, but thank you both very much. <laughs>